to our board meeting tonight. Appreciate you being here. If you would stand with me and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Tonight, we are pleased to recognize two of our latest schools of character. Over the years, we've added some schools. Uh, back in 2012, it was, uh, which one was it? I can't remember. McKelvey, I think. Uh, Ross and Oak Brook was last year. This year, we have two more schools that have achieved that distinction. We're very proud of them, Craig and Barrett's Elementary Schools. In addition, we're going to hear from Ameren, Missouri, regarding some financial incentives that Parkway has received from Ameren. So at this point, could I please welcome Eric Luters, Director of Sustainability and Purchasing, to come to the podium and introduce our guests from Ameren, Missouri. Great, thank you. Good evening, members of the board. Um, with the support of Parkway's Board of Education, we have been able to take great strides in reducing our energy use, making Parkway a more efficient school district. With the support of Ameren, Missouri's Business Efficiency Program, Parkway has been able to accelerate those efforts and achieve some remarkable energy reductions. I'd like to introduce Paige Selby, Ameren, Missouri's Business and Community Relations Representative, to present the school board with a pretty impressive token representing the financial incentives that Parkway has received over the years. Paige. <laughs> so real quickly, I, I just wanted to thank Eric. Uh, and our business partners, uh, it is my pleasure to present this very large check uh, for your exemplary actions toward making the district more energy efficient and more energy independent. So Parkway has received a total of $1,870,159 from Ameren, Missouri. So those, those are for projects including installing solar panels in your district buildings, completing lighting replacements, adding vending machine controls, and taking part in energy efficient new construction. So this total total includes $420,159 in rebates, or I'm sorry, in cash, as well as $1.45 million in solar rebates. So congratulations to everybody. The district completed 118 Biz Savers projects since 2009, resulting in a savings of 5,632,975 kilowatt hours. So that is a tremendous amount of energy off the grid, and we all thank you for that. So 32 pro solar projects, and each solar project saved 25.58 kilowatts. So again, thank you all. It's my pleasure to present this. Somewhere. I have a question. Uh, 
Comparatively, how, how do we compare to other school districts? <laughs> you want maybe let's go to the microphone. <laughs> you are setting the bar very high for many other school districts. So it's been wonderful to be able to use you, the Parkway School District, as an example that other schools can follow. So congratulations on that as well. And I also wanted to mention too, I, I brought some additional information. So if there are other business leaders out there and you're wondering how you can save that same amount of money with your business, then I've got some energy efficiency rebate information for you and then also for individuals in your homes. And I'll leave that on the back table. So thank you. And thank you all so much for your continued support for these, this effort. Thank you. Yeah, let's clarify that, right? Okay, so good evening, President Jacob, and wherever we have our Vice President Mogerman, maybe she's watching, uh, members of the board, Dr. Marty, Mrs. Peasold. It's with great pleasure that I stand here before you this evening to honor and recognize two of Parkway schools that have received the recognition as Missouri Schools of Character. As you all know, in Parkway, we define character education as the intentional effort to develop in young people core ethical and performance values that are widely affirmed across all cultures. And those adults embrace their critical role as role models. Students in the schools that have been identified as Missouri schools of character feel safe, respected, and connected to those around them, allowing them to thrive academically and socially and be motivated to give back to their communities. We all know our friend, Dr. Marvin Verkowitz, and I've said this before. Marvin often says that character education is rocket science. So this evening, I have the pleasure of presenting to you two schools that understand and are intentional as we guide our students in developing their character. And I also want to note that this year, 66 schools from 16 states have been recognized as state schools of character. And the Parkway School District has two of those schools. We should be very proud. First, Barrett's Elementary School. <laughs> Barrett's core values are be responsible, be respectful, and be safe. 
Barrett's also focuses on the seven habits of highly effective people. The habits guide students to better understand and live according to their core values. The goal at Barrett's is to teach and empower students to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Establish strong values and inspire future leaders. At Barrett's, every student has a school-wide leadership role based on their personal interest. Students value their leadership as they immediately take initiative and begin enacting goals and plans for their leadership teams as evidenced by posters they create, emails to staff, and through conversations. Staff at Barrett's intentionally integrate the core values and seven habits into their lessons and class meetings on an ongoing basis. Students can share how they are modeling and or using those values or habits in their work at any time and all the time. In maintaining the homeschool collaboration, Barrett's weekly parent newsletter promotes the core values and provides families with new ideas on how to incorporate these values at home. Another practice at Barrett's is their service learning. Each year, 100% of the students are engaged in at least one service learning project based on academic and social classroom goals. Every grade level, level performs a service learning project, which allows the students to act on their core values and make a positive impact on their community. Examples of this include performances at local retirement homes, collecting supplies for homeless animals, raising money to purchase books for an underfunded neighboring school, and collecting shoes for the Shoe Man Water Project to help other parts of the world have clean water. During the journey of learning more about the importance of character education in a school community, the adults at Barrett's now think a little differently about their work and continue to evaluate systems and structures. Because of a shared leadership philosophy, character education now is throughout the climate and culture of Barrett's. Administrators are eager to welcome new ideas like recently transforming the entire structure of the student leadership team to provide all students a school-wide leadership role. The staff collaborates to create songs based on the values which are taught to all students. Staff members are also intentional and deliberate in recognizing and complimenting students and classes who model the virtues. Parents, they work to secure grants and resources to support learning around character education. They organize special events at school and provide recommendations to enhance the work around character education. I would like to share with you in conclusion a few voices from the school community. One of their teachers said, it has been a pleasure to take part in and witness the student body being willing and eager to be responsible for their character and academics at Barrett's. In third grade, students track their own data and can articulate why they're doing so. A member of the office staff said, as a part of the non-teaching staff, I had the opportunity to present at a National Leader in Me Symposium on how non-classroom teachers and support staff utilize the seven habits with students and staff. I created tardy slips featuring the seven habits to reinforce the student's responsibility to be on time. I work with students creating music videos, showcasing the seven habits, as well as aspiring the student authors creating a book about our school mascot and therapy dog. A parent at Barrett said, Barrett's is more than a community. It is a family. I know my children are not only supported and cared for, but they are also challenged and pushed to be better people. The students and staff at Barrett's are truly a family. Please join me in recognizing Barrett's Elementary as a Missouri School of Character. Tonight, Principal Dr. Kelly Morton and Assistant Principal Jen Dikenbuchek, I wrote this in, Bridget Zimmerman, music teacher, cheerleader, and master editor, Bob the Bobcat, and members of the Barrett's community are here with us this evening. Will the Barrett's team please come forward to be recognized?
Congratulations. Thanks for coming. 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 Thanks Our second school to be recognized this evening is Craig Elementary School. The goal of Craig's character work is to empower students to see how character impacts every part of their world. Craig's core values are respectful, responsible, integrity, empathetic, and caring. Craig's core values are integrated into all aspects of the school community. Students are taught what the core values look like and sound like in each area of the school building. The values are taught and modeled during school assemblies, class meetings, and discussions about characters and stories. In addition, throughout all grade levels, students research, reflect, research, reflect, and appreciate the character of past and present heroes famous Missourians and government officials. Students reflect on how each individual demonstrates or demonstrated the Craig core values throughout their life and express their thoughts through reading, writing, presentations, or other forms. Each week, students at Craig and staff are involved in class meetings. The meetings build, are built into the master schedule and they allow for the opportunities for all learners to have their voices heard. Class meetings are used to discuss problems and brainstorm solutions. For example, the third graders were struggling to line up respectfully after recess. Therefore, the classroom teachers held a class meeting to brainstorm causes and solutions. This provided the opportunity for students to take ownership and be part of the problem solving. Well, thank you. I don't think the work of character education always starts with the adults. The adults pride themselves at Craig on being an ethical learning community that works together to model respectful and supportive behavior. The staff understands that they must create a strong foundation for the community. With this responsibility comes ongoing development focusing on character education and the impact it has on student achievement. And the folks at Craig have certainly been engaged in learning from national and local experts. In conclusion, I would like to share a few testimonies from staff at Craig. A certified teacher said, every staff member at Craig is involved daily with character education. Staff gave input into the selection of our core values, which are used throughout the building. Core value connections are given to students as well as staff for random acts of kindness. We all work together to ensure the success of all students and to prepare them for the future. A student said, I can't imagine leaving Craig this summer. There's something about this place that's so different from other schools. The teachers and principals seem like they really want to be here and spend time with us. The school has a sense of welcome and joy. Craig uses a thing called Craig Core Values. They are caring, empathetic, integrity, responsible, and respectful. We use these all the time on a daily basis. They are guiding things that we should try so we can be our best. A parent said, Craig School has a welcoming learning environment, conducive for all students. The student population is very diverse, consisting of different cultures and socioeconomic backgrounds. Because students learn the character traits, respect, responsibility, integrity, caring, and empathy, they coexist peacefully. I observed students cheering one another on in a supportive way rather than competing with one another. This creates a fun learning environment for all. And this is why my children love going to school. Please join me in recognizing Craig Elementary, Principal Bill Senti, Assistant Principal Baron Waller, 
otherwise known as Mr. Map Hawk and Mr. Map Stash, <laughs> and Megan Gerberding, Car Craig's character council facilitators. Also, we have with us this evening members of the community, partners at Craig Elementary School. Jerry McQueen from the Creve Corps Fire Department has joined us, along with Judy Coyman with Operation Food Search. We also have parents, students, and other members of the Craig community. Will the team please come forward? We certainly want to thank everyone again. I want to begin by thanking Amron, Missouri, and Eric. Uh, this isn't the only thing that Eric does, but it's such a wonderful accomplishment. And uh, you don't realize it, the solar panels that are on top of each building, uh, the work that went into that, and it just slowly but every day accumulates and keeps, uh, and you see how it adds up there to the 1.8 million. Uh, just a, a marvelous effort with the lights and everything else that he's done. And not only has he put more efficient lights in, but they even light up better. <laughs> so we, we thank you so much for that. And he has a lot of other work that he does uh, in purchasing as well. And we're just so proud of our two additional schools, Oak Brook and, uh, and Barrett's. Oh, we're, 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 we're proud of <laughs> So I wanted to see if you were listening. <laughs> uh, both of these schools have uh, deserve so much attention and appreciation from parents and students. It's uh, you know, when you think of character, some might think, "Well, why do we care about that?" Well, it, we care about the whole st the whole person, the whole student, and uh, we don't want them just to be good at math and uh, and writing and those kinds of things, but we want them to be good citizens and good members of their families. And I think what they learn there at these schools uh, really shows up, not just at school, but other places too. So thank you for that kind of work and for becoming those kind of schools in Parkway. And before we finish, I just there's just one other thing that some of us participated in today. There were a couple of events that took place that are special in Parkway, some recognitions. And I'd like Dr. Marty to at least begin that. And he may turn it over to somebody else, but I would like you to be aware of, of special recognitions that happened this afternoon. Well, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, we, we had the opportunity today, several of us, uh, Chris, myself, uh, Desi Kirchhofer, and um, uh, 
members of two schools who have, uh, were surprised today with the naming of uh, two St. Louis Region Principals of the Year, Assistant Principal of the Year and a Principal of the Year. Uh, Dr. Beth Mindorf was uh, surprised today and uh, a party of several of her uh, colleagues plus uh, guests from other districts came uh, to West uh, Library and uh, she walked into uh, uh, this large gathering and uh, was announced that she's the high school, middle school, uh, excuse me, high school uh, assistant principal of the year. And uh, she was very surprised and we were honored uh, to have her. And then from there we went over to uh, West Middle School. Uh, we got everybody in the gym amazingly and uh, Dr. Miller, Annie Miller was taken away, I think a little plot, right, Desi? The, uh, by the uh, SRO taking her off campus and then brought into the gym. She walked into a gym full and uh, again the same delegation and a number of us and she was named, uh, Dr. Miller was named the St. Louis Region uh, Principal, Middle School Principal of the Year, I'm sorry, Middle School Principal of the Year. Named, these, both of these uh, uh, naming was uh, by the um, Missouri Association of Secondary School Administrators which oversees the administrators or the, is the Association for Middle and High School Administrators. So. Um, both Annie Miller, Dr. Miller, Dr. Mendorf were honored today and it was a delight to recognize them. I should say uh, that we also had uh, the St. Louis uh, Region Elementary Principal of the Year and I had the pleasure of being down at uh, Tantera a couple weeks ago to honor Dr. Lisa Luna. And uh, so we've been pretty blessed this year to have wonder wonderful recognition of our uh, elementary and, mi and middle and high school principals. So Desi, do you want, did you want to add anything? Do you have any? Did I, did I do a, complete everything? But uh, Dr. Kirchhoff works very closely with our principals. And I know, Chris, we had a great time. It was a wonderful uh, opportunity to be out in the schools and sharing that wonderful announcement. I, I believe, and I know uh, Dr. Kirchhoff shares with me, uh, leadership of our schools, and you see it again tonight, uh, uh, certainly uh, principals with strong skills and their ability to work with their staffs and motivate the, you know, the students and the staff and their community and rally them is so key, and we're, we're really blessed in in Parkway to have that kind of leadership in, in nearly all our schools, all our schools, and it's nice to be able to recognize those, those leaders. I thought you might enjoy knowing that, so thank you, Dr. Marty. We thank you for joining us for this part of our board meeting tonight. We're honored that you could be here with us for these recognitions, and at this time we'll take a deep, uh, brief break, and <laughs> then we'll, we'll be back uh, shortly. Thank you. Yeah, a deep break. <laughs>
Meeting back to order, 6.0, additions, corrections, and modifications to the agenda. 6.01, deletion of agenda item 11.25. This is the approval of request for professional services lunch trays. 6.02, addition to the agenda, item 11.03, approval of personnel items. And 6.03, update to agenda item 11.3. Uh, approval of personnel items. 7.0 citizen statements, there are none. I feel like Liz. <laughs> 8.0, approval of the agenda. May I, I'm asking for a motion and a second to approve the agenda for the regular meeting of the Board of Education scheduled for April 6, 2016. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 6-0. Resolutions, there are none. Communications, calendar of meetings. The next regular board meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, April 20th, 2016 at 7 p.m. at Central Middle School with an anticipated closed session at 6 p.m. 10.02, board candidates. Every year we have an election. There's either two or three seats that are open uh, either for the re-election of, uh, of uh, board members or for new candidates and just this uh, so it was yesterday, yesterday wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the terms of Tom Applebaum and Sam Sor Sorrentino were to expire the Board of Education election was held yesterday uh, those of you who went to vote recognized that it was a little more cumbersome than usual because it was totally mm -hmm. manual this time and the preliminary results and I say preliminary only because they haven't been certified but they're pretty well what they are show that Dr. Sam Sortino and uh, Sudhir Rathoid are the successful candidates for the two open positions for the Board of Education. We congratulate both you, Sam, and Sudhir, and thank you for your commitment to Parkway School District and your willingness to serve on the Board of Education. 
And I must say that we also thank Tom Applebaum, who has served six years at the Parkway and the Parkway Board of Education. His great legal mind has helped us on many occasions, and he's been a great friend and uh, colleague to work with here on the board. Those of you who may not know, uh, so here, could, could you go ahead and stand? Uh, you'll be sworn in here in a couple of weeks. Uh, to the board. And I, I know you don't really know what you've gotten yourself into. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I think with your commitment, you'll, you'll do just fine. Uh, <coughs> board liaison reports, uh, are there any that the board would like to, any meetings or things that you went to you'd like to share with the board? Or <coughs> spring break. Probably not much. Everybody want to talk about spring break? <laughs> uh, I, I did actually go to an event. Uh, it was the USGBC Growing Green Awards. Uh, you know, not, to, not to beat a dead horse, but uh, uh, we had four schools that were um, Energy Star certified. Uh, so it was a, another proud moment for Parkway in the area of sustainability. And as you can see, it pays off sometimes in a really big check. <laughs> that was impressive. Anyone else? OK. 10.04 uh, board subcommittee uh, reports. I don't know if we had one, did we? No, we, we rescheduled that one. Upcoming subcommittee meetings, student services will be meeting on April 12th at 3.30 PM at ISC. And 11.0 action items. May I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda as presented here in the April 6, 2016 board materials? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there anything to be pulled to action or closed? I know there's at least one item. Um, agenda item 11.26, please. Okay. May I have a motion and a second to approve all of the consent items except 11.26? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And there are no opposed. That motion carries 6-0. So 11.26, I think Lisa Meredith, our superintendent of TLA, is, we just thought it'd be good for many of you to know a little bit more about this. It's not that we have so many questions, but that it's a, a great endeavor that we're trying to get started in Parkway. Lisa. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about our participation in the Lead Higher Initiative. This is um, work that centers around our district goal number one about achievement for all. And as you know, over the past couple of years, the administrators have, uh, throughout the district, building level and district administrators, have really been work is working and focused on excellence through equity. The Lead Higher Initiative is a national effort spearheaded by the nonprofit Equal Opportunity Schools. It has support from the White House's My Brothers Keeper Alliance, the U.S. Department of Education, the International Baccalaureate, and the College Board. It is also backed by generous contributions from the Jack Kent Koch Foundation, Tableau, and Google. The Lead Higher Initiative seeks to enable secondary schools to fully reflect their racial and economic diversity at the highest academic levels. So we know that we have rigorous academic opportunities for students, but we know not all students believe that they are capable or choose to enroll in them. So this program is to help us identify students, encourage them to enroll in advanced placement courses, and then for us to learn more about systems and structures that we can put in place to ensure that they are successful. This is a year-long partnership. EOS, or Equal Opportunity Schools, will support each of our high schools by providing field-leading data analysis to measure student and school-specific causes of participation gaps. They'll help us develop a comprehensive strategy for addressing those causes. And by the fall of 2017, we should transition to where we have better representation and success within our advanced placement classes. So the process is a three-step process. 
we will start with a study and we will actually kick this off on April 13th with our onboarding meeting from Equal Opportunity Schools if this is passed this evening. At that time we will begin our timeline of how we will study. The study will include surveys of the staff and the administrators within each building and even the district level administrators about growth mindset beliefs, about structures and systems that are in place. There will be surveys of our students and our teachers, and we will look to identify the causes and the access barriers for our students. The next step will be to strategize. So then each building with the support of ES EOS will develop a strategy for their building of how they will move forward to increase participation. And they will also plan what structures they will put in place to help students be successful and then we'll have begin implementation in the 17-18 school year. Um, so what they will do is they will help us look for individual students who maybe say that they have not been enrolled in AP classes, they didn't feel like they were capable, or no one, they didn't know how to enroll, or um, no one ever told them that they thought they were good enough to be in one. And then we'll also find students that teachers are like, not quite sure why they haven't enrolled. Um, we'll find students who have GPAs or involvement in school activities that parallel with students who are successful in AP classes. And so the data will help us identify those students. And then they will receive individual invitations from somebody within the school to participate. And then we'll learn about what we need to do to help them. So this really is about helping us achieve all. Um, with this also, uh, the lead hire um, liaison for the state of Missouri, Dr. Belcher, worked with the State Department, Missouri State Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, and has secured for us a grant that will offset about $8,000 um, of this per school, so in the proposal that you saw this evening. We will be one of 200, is it 250 high schools from around the country. So we'll actually have four of those 250 50 high schools around the country who were selected to participate in this. So we're pretty excited about the opportunity. Um, it's an opportunity to bring together a lot of initiatives that we've been working on um, through the past couple of years. So DIA will be tied to this, PAMI will be tied to this. So we'll, we'll reach out to those initiatives to are those um, support systems within our organization to help us improve our support systems as well. So really excited about the opportunity. <clears throat> about how many students might there be in each high school that would participate in this? You know, I don't have the data packet in front of me, but I can get that for you. So um, through the help of Dr. Tyson and Mr. Beckner, EOS has already identified our gap between um, our percentage of students um, from diverse backgrounds that are enrolled in our schools and how what percentage are enrolled in AP courses and they've identified the gap and for each building they've identified the number of students that we additional numbers that we would need to increase and help be successful to close that proportional um, gap so it's a different number per building and I can get that for you mm -hmm. thank you any uh, other questions uh, do you know what a be and how that might be monitored or there are other schools in the area here that are participating in this that we might we have some idea of what the success rate is on this so there uh, there is not anybody else in the st. Louis area who has participated to this point okay. Columbia Public Schools where dr. Belcher was um, former superintendent before he retired they participated and they shared a great success rate and it was whenever you look at and I again I don't have those specific numbers um, the high school principals dr. Marty Desi and I we we evaluated that, but not only did they have an increase in percentage of students participating, but the success level of those students. Um, so it was a high success rate. And again, I can get that background information for you. That would be helpful. Okay. Of the 250 schools that will be participating next year, there will be some other schools within the St. Louis area who will be participating, and we will work as a cohort. So we will be sharing strategies uh, at our onboard meeting on Thursday, we know there will be some leaders from Belleville, um, Illinois, who will be here for their onboarding as well. Um, and I know that they are talking with some other schools in the area. I believe as part of the whole uh, program, there is an external evaluation that is like a grant that would be followed. Follow. 
There is. Part of the MOU that you have to um, approve this evening talks about a multi-year commitment for them to continue to collect data on the sustainability. The other thing that we're hopeful for with this, Debbie, that we will want Dr. Tyson to help us with is we are hopeful that we can learn from this program that is about AP courses and then we can apply that to other rigorous opportunities we have where we might have um, disparity in our enrollment, such as our dual credit or dual enrollment courses, um, our honors courses. Uh, you know, we know that we have um, disproportionate enrollment in some of our Project Lead the Way classes. So if we can learn about this process, mm -hmm. then we are hopeful that we can apply that process to other um, offerings within our district. Thank you. You know, the, the board has challenged me ever since I was superintendent to close our achievement gap, and uh, we were working at it, but uh, what excites me about this is um, it's not just about achievement, it's about opportunities. So before you get to achievement, you have to have you know, opportunities for young people. And uh, I'm really excited about this, really excited because uh, I've got to know Dr. Belcher, former superintendent of Columbia, as Lisa mentioned. And by the way, if that name sounds familiar, uh, Dr. Belcher and sports marketing. <laughs> so this is our second right. work with Dr. Belcher uh, and his, some of his leadership. But uh, he tells great stories of what happened in Columbia. And it really is uh, really getting uh, the whole staff, the administration and teachers and the community really uh, understanding how important it is to uh, get young people to look uh, at their potential. You know, sometimes I, I believe we in schools take for granted that people are just going to sign up for these things. But you, there's got to be some encouragement, some systems in place that really get people to take a look at, or take young people to take a look at these opportunities, which lead then to higher achievement, higher success. There is already, since we started this conversation in the fall, exploring about EOS, EOS and the potential for Parkway, I have had conversations with some folks from other districts and uh, have learned some strategies. So some strategies that are a strategy that I've heard at least two other districts use, or the buildings within districts, is they trained every teacher in their high school in AP strategies. So even if you weren't teaching an AP course, but the strategies that you learn in that, and then if you apply that to your teaching in other courses, that helps prepare students. Um, related to that, uh, Aaron Crowley and Courtney Yeager have put together a proposal, and we will begin doing some uh, pre-AP training for our teachers, for our middle school and high school teachers, to learn those strategies to be applied in other courses. And they're also working with College Board for us to become a training site for AP teachers so that we can train our teachers without sending them to other parts of our country for two weeks for a week for the long training. So um, this has already initiated some good work in our district and we are just at the beginning point of implementing, but it's already changed some conversations. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. May I have a motion and a second to approve the consent uh, item 11.26? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries 6 0. Before we leave the consent items, let me just uh, mention one thing that gets buried as you go through a mountain of these. Uh, item 11.05 uh, references are negotiations and successful negotiations I might add with the nurses union and I just want to compliment uh, particularly Mimi and and her people and uh, Kathy. Kathy. <laughs> Kathy and with uh, uh, Amy I mean they came together they, they improved the language uh, so much more and I think we ended up with a real nice contract for the next three years I, that is going to be very good so Thank you very much, uh, and I just wanted to recognize uh, we have a good group of our nurses up here who uh, we enjoy. Peck, why don't you stand up just so the rest of us can recognize you. Dr. Wallen is with us too. Yes. Hey, Reminding me, we may have some students that are here observing tonight. Is that correct? Could you, are, are you, uh, what university are you from? Can you stand up so we can? <coughs> right, we welcome you here and, uh, and uh, are glad to have you here and encourage you in, in your endeavors as, uh, as a student and hopefully a teacher one day. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. 
13.0 policy review. Tonight there are none. 14.0, we've been looking forward to this for the last 20 months. <laughs> We're finally here. 14.01, middle school program evaluation. Uh, may I call on Desi Kershoffer, our deputy superintendent. It's been a quick 20 months. <laughs> yeah. There's been a lot happening. So good evening, President Jacob, distinguished members of the Board of Education, Dr. Marty, and Secretary Peasel. It's a pleasure to set the stage for this evening's presentation regarding the middle school study. While there were many people involved in the study itself and the collection of data and the deep research that occurred over the past 20 months, I would like to acknowledge some of the key leaders involved in the process. Amy Branson, Jason Cosdren, Kevin Beckner, Dr. Dr. Randy Eichel, Dr. Aaron Schulte, Dr. Dr. Becky Litherland, and then the two folks who pulled together this excellent team and led this work, Dr. Mike Bogus and Dr. Courtney Yeager. Thank you to all of your contributions and being able to present for us tonight, so thank you. So to get to the heart, why do we do program evaluations or these types of, of studies? The simple answer is to continue to improve and to continue to get better for our students. The studies and evaluations are not necessarily put together to fix things or to address a specific concern that we may have, but to continuously improve things as well as serve as a reminder that we are a dynamic learning organization. I will say, however, this study itself, because of the size and scope, was particularly difficult. It became all things middle school. So they tried to tackle everything that you could do. So I'm gonna just tell you right now, we learned a lot, not just about middle school through this process, but about the process itself and what we really can tackle and study and take on as a group. Um, but this team did a tremendous job of leading through such a difficult task. Um, as you know, in 2009, after years and years of middle school models being studied, developed, discussed, presented, an eight period day schedule was approved by the board that included double com arts at all grade levels, core teams of five teachers, physical education every day, a new sixth grade exploratory class called Future Pathways, and a consistent middle school district course guide. Along with those changes, many other changes have occurred in the district wide. For example, restructuring in TLA, there's been evolving assessment practices, professional learning communities, later start time for the middle school, as well as many other things over the last five years. A major challenge four or five years ago occurred also when budget reallocations and a need to tighten staffing occurred. Having a time to, to having at times result to split some teams or having to pull content areas off teams, making full implementation of a new schedule difficult at times and difficult to recognize the impact. All that said, coupled with the complexities of adolescent development, middle school is a very happy place to be and place to live for staff and students as evidenced by many surveys and our listening tour data feedback. Again, this team did a tremendous amount of research and data collection, collaborating with parents, community members, administrators, teachers. They collected data using surveys focus groups, the infinite, infinite campus, PARS data, while also study, studying other program evaluations, including our most recent listening tour results. Needless to say, it was quite an undertaking. Tonight, they're here to collaboratively share some findings, recommendation, and thoughts on future direction. Now, I'd like to turn things over to the leaders of the study, Dr. Mike Bogus and Dr. Courtney Yeager. Um, I just wanted to start out, the historian in me loves a little bit of context. So one of the pieces that we looked at and discovered as we concluded this study were the 1999 guiding model patterns of practice. And I wanted to share these with you because what we found is they're very similar to the work that we've been doing in the last 20 months. And I think what holds true about the things that we found important 15 years ago are still true today, and we're continuing to improve and work through um, similar issues. We want, as we did in 1999, to continue to have curriculum that is challenging, integrative, and exploratory. We're working on varied teaching and learning approaches. Um, Kevin will talk about assessment and evaluation that promote learning. 
we want flexible organizational structures, programs and policies that foster health, wellness, and safety. And Erin will be touching on that. And also, Erin, comprehensive guidance and support services. So as we looked at each of our study areas, and I'll just briefly put them up. Um, and this is what Desi was talking about with the scope of the project. We wanted to honor all of the things that teachers in our initial focus group wanted to learn about and work through. And so we have five different topic areas that kind of turned into six. Individualization, grading assessment feedback, character development and community. And Erin has a 3B topic, which was also her work in counseling. Curriculum and instruction, and then scheduling structures and staffing. So we thought that we needed a way to tackle all five topic areas. And what we found is in the feedback we gathered from teachers, we had some basic questions that emerged that guided our work. We looked for the best practices in each topic area and how do they challenge our current realities. We wanted to know if the way we currently implement that topic area led us to achieving our mission. And we also wanted to know what aspects are site-based versus district-based and then what supports and resources are in place for teachers to implement the given topic area. Good evening. As Jason Kosdren and I began our study of individualization, we realized that really that's woven into all of our other topic areas as well, but most naturally it dovetailed with curriculum and instruction. So we started with best practices, and the organization that we will always go to around here is the Association of Middle-Level Educators and the document This We Believe, which really lays out best practices for middle school. Um, from there, we thought, okay, what will we use to assess? What instrument will we use to assess um, what AMLE says is the are the best practices for middle school? Um, what we came across was a survey called Schools to Watch, and it is aligned, we, we really took a good look at and scrutinized the, the survey to make sure it was aligned not only with this we believe, but also with our mission, vision, and learning principles, and found that the only area in our mission that was, was not addressed, or that was addressed that's not in our mission, was advisory, one, an individual um, advocate for every student. Um, the areas that Schools to Watch took a look at were the academic excellence in middle schools, developmental responsiveness, social equity, and organizational structures and procedures. It was a self-report, so we talked, or, or we gave the, the survey to students and to teachers um, about those four areas. And, and from there, it really gave us our current reality, which is that second question. Um, and, and what we focused in on, we really took a, a good look at, were the, the areas that were significantly below all the others. We, we really scored well when it, when it came to community, when it came to quality of teachers and instruction, but it was some of the, it were, there were two that stood out. Um, and the, the individualization, and again, the curriculum instruction came together um, with, those, with those problem statements, which really were, I don't know if that's a laser pointer, that's not right. Um, the first one is, you know, we found that teachers felt that we don't have enough time and support to meet the needs of all learners, to give them a rigorous um, academic um, experience. And then that we're also operating in silos, as you see the one in curriculum and instruction. And we're not giving our students the opportunity to solve real world problems. And when you talk to them, really, uh, and anecdotally, when, when you say, what, you know, are, is what you're doing in, in English language arts really something that you use in social studies. And while they are writing and they're reading, they don't necessarily see that connection. Um, even in science and math, they're not seeing those connections. And our teachers confirmed that, that it's that interdisciplinary work is not happening. And that is absolutely something that is key to middle school. Um, in summary, as an organization, we really believe that our mission is to meet all the, the needs of all our students. And the teachers were asking for their guidance and help for that, including the time and support to provide and to ensure that all our students are achieving and have the opportunity to meet those rigorous standards. So from there, we came up with our recommendations. And really, it, it revolved around two things. One, development for teachers. Um, and it was about the differentiation at tier one. So what's happening in that classroom setting that, that that helps meet the needs of all the students. Um, that, that really dives down into that collaborative learning. So we're, we're already starting that, that work with Kagan, um, the training that, that teachers are getting um, around that. And then also studying the pros and cons of a push-in, um, enrichment, or um, 
support uh, or that, that pull out situation, um, studying the pros and cons of that. And then the second one is, you know, to study the current use of time during the regular school day to find opportunities and challenges related to the choice and time for remediation and enrichment. And that really came down to including the freedom that kids want to explore their talents and passions. Um, it's that choice piece. And then also the time for remediation and enrichment, both inside and outside the classroom. Um, the, the third piece for the, the timing was really the use of advisory to support um, character ed. It's, it's really um, that, that one of the questions about site-based versus district, when you think about advisory, every middle school has advisory, however, they implement it in a different way, and they've carved out time and taken time here and there um, to provide that opportunity for that, the students to have that one adult advocate that may not necessarily be attached to a curricular area, but really that students feel confident confiding in, um, asking advice from, uh, that kind of thing. So that, that other piece is, is using time and, and carving out some time for academic support. So that's really the area, individualization one. So, as you can see from um, Amy's piece just on individualization, that also bleeds into other areas around structures and staffing and character ed. So it was really, we kept trying to flesh things out and then it kept coming back together um, for the sake of the study and honoring each of the topic areas. So I'm just gonna touch on the things around curriculum and instruction. Again, the outlier in the survey that over half of our teachers took and I think like five-sixths of our students took um, was that there, while there are examples of teams integrating curriculum throughout the district, those interdisciplinary approaches to reinforce those concepts aren't prevalent yet. And this is something that teachers are eager to work on. They do want to realign with one another. And in working with our teacher teams to come up with the recommendations based on their feedback, um, we do have some ideas of what we want to do moving forward. Um, first of all, uh, teachers are ready to audit and look at revising our curriculum and we have um, potentially some new standards coming this April. We're kind of waiting to see what happens with that. Um, and we've also been doing a lot of work to try to vertically align within the core disciplines. Um, our recommendation is that we look horizontally across the disciplines, including the character ed standards, and um, strategically make those connections in kind of that stage one overall thematic uh, we'd like to form a team representative of all schools and grade levels willing to participate in a two-year commitment to research, learn instructional approaches, and write revised curriculum frameworks during the 16-17 school year. And this includes agreements around integration and flexibility. Um, we'd like to present this to you in May of 2017. Teachers also want development around um, transfer, rigor relevance, and project and problem-based and inquiry learning. So we're not just continuing to make connections and kind of partner side by side in our curriculum, but we're truly asking kids to solve those real world relevant problems. So teachers are asking for development in that area. And then, as we mentioned earlier, we do have team time. We're lucky to have team time. And so you may be wondering, isn't this what happens during team time? And over the last few years, as we've also developed ourselves within our core disciplines through our PLCs, our CLTs, um, that time has come out of team time. But also teams have spent a lot of time looking at individual problem solving around supporting students. And so they don't feel like in the current structures they have a lot of time to really talk um, about curriculum, and that was kind of the original intent. So we've moved um, a little bit away from that. We're still doing wonderful things during those team time, and they're all important, but we're going to have to study the use of our time. And Kevin is next to talk about grading assessment and feedback. Well, thank you for the chance to talk about grading assessment and feedback in middle school, and we just like had just like we had other surveys from middle school staff, we did a specific grading and feedback survey and had over 90% of staff participate, which was really incredible. Sharing their current practices, sharing what they hope new practices might look like, and overall the big picture was that we want teachers using grading practices that are consistent. One, And that, that was actually from our teachers, the number one thing when we asked them, what would you want to change about grading in middle, middle school? They said, we want more consistency. 
They also wanted a lot of other things, but that was the primary thing and the main thing that rose up, that they're using best practices and specifically shift those practices so that we can really communicate a student's achievement of course goals and mission-related objectives, which is right in line with our current Project Parkway goals and action steps that we've been working on over the past several years. To accomplish that, uh, two recommendations have come out of this work. One, revise our middle school grading system to make sure we're aligning with our what we believe about grading and feedback, and then to do that, form a team specifically to work on just that beginning hopefully next year with a target implementation date uh, beginning in sixth grade and rolling that up uh, for the 2018 school year with one grade coming on each additional year. And now character development. Um, good evening. I was uh, really excited to be able to present on this specifically at the middle school level. It made me think of uh, something when I was obtaining my graduate degree, something one of my professors said when we were talking about the development of middle school uh, students. And he said, middle school students don't have relationships. Middle school students are their relationships. Um, and that has stuck with me ever since. And um, I think we do a good job in Parkway of looking at our students, the whole child, um, thinking about them socially, thinking strategically about how we're going to develop community in each of our middle schools. Um, I think we're intentional and strategic about this. Um, when we looked at character education in our middle schools, uh, we looked at our um, national organization, character.org, and what they recommend. We also are very lucky to have local resources like Character Plus. Um, we've already been implementing a lot of this work, so we were already doing a lot of surveys, so we have a, a character and climate survey that um, we were able to work from. We also have a lot of our middle schools, again, already doing a lot of work in this, and so they had already been surveying their teachers. We had a survey ready to go about how they felt uh, that they were doing with character ed in their schools. Um, so we had a lot of information to go off of from our team. Um, and so our specific recommendations in this area, number one was to expand our budgets to include specific money and resources for middle school advisory period. So as you heard Amy talk about already, all five of our middle schools have advisory in some form. Um, the research in this area is very strong, that this is something, again, particularly in the middle school. Middle school students need to have relationships with their teachers. They need to have relationships with other students. And if we don't strategically make those positive relationships, we run the risk, a very high risk, that those will go negative. Advisory is a great structure to help us help us with that. Um, so we'd like to allocate specific money and resources, um, potentially even time, to help our middle schools refine what they're doing with advisory. Secondly, we'd like to expand student elective choices to include a leadership or character option. Um, so a big thing in character education, voice and choice for our students. We know middle school students want a little more independence. They're kind of figuring out who they are. Uh, we want to continue to intentionally teach this. This would be a direct, intentional way, a class about how to be a leader. Um, it also would foster a student's, uh, if they had an interest in being, like, how do I become a leader? How am I, how do I become a better person? Um, that would be direct instruction on how to do that. And, um, you know, I think about that with regard to, you know, how do we teach math? We would never say, well, we just do math problems on the board and we hope they kind of pick up on that. Um, we intentionally teach them how to do math. And uh, I don't think character is any exception to that. Um, and third, we'd like to engage middle school staff in professional development around the topic of restorative practices. So um, that's something we haven't really touched on yet in this report, um, but every single of our middle schools has at the very least looked into implementing restorative practices in their school, and some of them are already uh, practicing this every day. Um, and so all of them asked us for, you know, can we at least get more development and how can we look at that, how can we do that? And that is another strong piece of how are we building community at our middle schools? That's just another strategic, intentional way to do that. Again, uh, 
the next, the next recommendation. Uh, we would like to, and you've heard this before, make more explicit connections between curriculum and character so that we make sure we guarantee character education through more than just social studies, um, but in everything. And this has the added benefit, and I think it can be such a win-win if we can make these explicit connections. Um, it makes the curriculum itself more relevant to students because then they're using it in their daily life. Um, how does this apply to me? How does this apply to my world? And um, makes the curriculum more relevant and also gives us another in about how we're going to be intentional about teaching students about being good people. And finally, in the character ed recommendations, uh, we would like to add a fourth C to the mission statement, um, comparing, compassionate, what have you, uh, so that it reflects the work we're doing in character education. So as you saw, one of our guiding questions in this study was, um, you know, how does, how does the work we're doing align with our mission? And as we looked at it, we actually found that our mission didn't align with our work. Um, we're doing a whole lot of work in this area. We know that it's something we value. We know that Parkway really cares about uh, making our students good citizens, uh, but we don't feel that it's explicitly stated in our mission statement. And um, that is something, you know, again, an another thing I learned in my graduate studies was you have to practice what you preach, but you also have to preach what you practice. Um, and so that would just sort of catch up the mission statement to what we're doing and, and what we're working so hard with with regard to character ed. Um, the second topic that I was in charge of was counseling. And um, this came out of some of your questions when we uh, did the initial board report, the pre-report. And um, while character ed is something that counselors also participate in, I wanted to separate it out because it's not just the job of the counselor, it's the job of everybody. And um, so there are specific things with counseling. You all ask questions, some of our teachers ask questions, and so our piece of this report was to answer those questions that um, everyone had. So for this piece of the report, we consulted our national organization, which is the American School Counselor Association, um, as well as our uh, Missouri State uh, model comprehensive guidance um, suggestions. So our recommendations in this area are to increase student, teacher, and parent usage of Navion's family connections at the middle school level. Um, we've been trying to go out and get to places where parents already are, like parent-teacher conferences, um, open houses, to you know, give out information about what this is. But what we know is that our counselors have started using it within their curriculum, so we guarantee that students get on it at least once per year, but we feel it needs to be more than that. Um, they're their career decisions, their personality, inventories, things that they're learning about on this system um, need to be more comprehensive than just the counselor comes and talks to you one time throughout the year. So the way we think we might be able to do this is get teachers using it, again, those curricular connections, also get parents to understand what's on there and what might be useful for them. Um, Second recommendation is that as the social emotional needs of our students continue to rise, uh, both in frequency and severity, and we're seeing that at every single middle school, uh, we'd like to hire more social workers. We actually have really good ratios of counselor to student uh, in our district, and we are really proud of that. We're very happy with that. Of course, if you want to toss more counselors our way, that would be great, <laughs> and we won't say no. Uh, but what we have found is that counselors really work in conjunction with social workers, especially when more severe issues arise. And our, our social work to student ratios are not what our counselor to student ratios are. Um, and in comparison to other districts, they're not what they could be. Um, and so we would recommend that we hire more social workers to help with those issues. Um, and finally, we'd like to continue to facilitate and figure out how we can make it a little maybe more strategic and easier on the counselors to uh, continue the conversation and open dialogue between counselors and other stakeholder groups. So as we looked at what are counselors spending a lot of their time doing, you know, we talked to teachers, we talked to counselors, we talked to parents, um, and oftentimes the counselor is the one who receives a piece of information that's important for a lot of stakeholders to know. It's important for the teacher to know, the principals to know, for uh, specials, teachers of special um, school district, teachers of in, um, uh, electives, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, and so the counselor is the one who has to communicate all of that information to everybody. And um, so how can we make that easier on them so that everybody's getting the information that they need to support the student in the best way that they can? So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Mike Boggess. Good evening. Scheduling, staffing, and structures. 
who that all stakeholders wanted to discuss first, but leaders of the topic areas wanted to ensure that the findings and needs within each of the other areas would drive the topic five discussions. In previous topic areas, we learned that in order to ensure individualization and personalization, the scheduling, staffing, and structure should be flexible and blended. To ensure interdisciplinary collaboration, middle school should be structured into teams and provided with time to work on curriculum and plan for real world problems and problem based learning. In order to ensure grading, assessment, and feedback, Practices are aligned to our grading practices and beliefs. Teachers need time to collaborate within CLTs and across disciplinary teams. In order to ensure character education, that it's infused, there should be an advisory time as well as integration in all curricular areas. So, outside of our guaranteed team time, our current scheduling practices do not support integrated disciplines, nor does it offer flexibility for student enrichment and remediation outside of the regular class time. Our middle school schedule should allow students time to pursue a personal direction based on an understanding of their talents and interests. A team of work, a teacher work team representing staff from all five middle schools came together on December 14th and again on January 11th to gauge current reality and examine schedules from 13 area middle schools. Between those two meetings, a Google survey was given to all middle school teachers in Parkway to gather prospective top three priorities to support all students in their learning. District coordinators uh, were engaged in feedback and that was collected on December 17th, as well as middle school principal feedback on February 11th. As a result of our last 20 months, whoa, as a result of our last 20 months, we recommend that a study team consisting of staff and administration, including Phil Roguski from Human Resources, consider alternatives to our current schedule. This schedule should honor the recommendations you heard this evening in all five topic areas, including time to implement curriculum, including differentiation at the tier one level, student choice, including opportunities for students to pursue a personal direction in their learning, time for remediation and enrichment, use of advisory groups and time, and a commitment to team time for inter interdisciplinary possibilities. We anticipate a final product by the October 2016. Thank you, Dr. Boggess. So in closing, as you can see, this incredible team, along with their colleagues who were not able to be here, have done incredible work. In the five topics, they've come to us with 17 recommendations. So what is next? As we begin to look at Project Parkway 2.0, you can see that the 17 recommendations are tightly aligned to our existing goals. So it will be our work to ensure that these recommendations are embedded into the strategies and action steps so that we are held accountable to continuing um, to make our very, very um, strong middle school program even stronger. So with that, questions for this incredible team, and I would really like to recognize them for their incredible work. Open it up to the board members who might have questions for any of these wonderful individuals. Erin, <clears throat> um, I guess this is for you about the advisory. Can you give us a description of what your vision of that would look like? So when I was looking at best practices within advisory, um, and our middle schools are really doing, they, they range from every single day for a certain amount of time to probably once a month at minimum. Uh, some are doing twice a month or late start days, things like that. Um, I think that like many things that we do in Parkway, um, I, I, the research I found was figure out what works for your school <laughs> and your environment. Um, and so I don't know that I would make a mandate of like we need to do it you know, every day for this amount of time. Um, and I also just don't think that that's uh, how we operate with, within anything we do with character ed. I think it should be a school, school decision um, because that's the best way to get some buy-in. And so I think it would, 
it would look like working with principals and schools leaders that are they currently each have advisory lead teams and so um, you know looking at who's leading the work and then what does that school want and envision and then um, with regard to like curriculum or budget um, there are curriculums out there like you know Chelsea and I just had a meeting with leader and me there's a um, curriculum at the middle school level so that could be a choice um, there's um, through the the Center for character and citizenship they send me all kinds of like curriculum curriculum um, resources that you could be using during that time so I think just what fits for each middle school and like so many things I think it would have to be the buy-in would have to come from them via we chose this this is what we want for our school so more of an organic process than a um, dictated so right. but what is I, I guess my question is what is it is it a homeroom is it a you know your this is your lead adults that you come to with a problem outside of your classwork? I mean, yeah, I, I guess I just a great don't question. understand. Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so ideally, it is a multi-age, um, and it's it's time, like let's just say they're meeting every day. The same group of kids meets with the same teacher every day, um, and it's a couple sixth graders, a couple seventh graders, a couple eighth graders. The eighth graders act as mentors for the other two ages, so then you have, um, you know, again, the, those leadership skills for them, and then the uh, mentees learn how to be and how to act, and then they take on that role as they go up. Um, and it can be anything, and when, as I was looking through like best practices, um, it can vary from, let's talk about academics and let's have, our, you know, we have this member of our, our advisory community who's really struggling with math, um, but we have this eighth grader who's really good at math, so let's pair them up. Let's, uh, we're gonna have an academic day in advisory and we're gonna work on this together um, because it's about caring for each other. But it can also be like team building. Um, you know, we're gonna get to know each other and we're going to learn how to treat each other with respect, treat each other well. Um, they can do projects together with, uh, connected with that of like, you know, this is how we're building a team. Um, I know that a lot of, or a few of the middle schools at least do um, school-wide projects, but then each advisory has something to present within that project. So um, again, just community building all the way through, we're going we're gonna to think about academics in this situation. Okay. Is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Are there uh, specific objective, objectives for what advisory should achieve? In other words, should we know what the end result is in terms of what we want to accomplish for students and then schools would have kind of a pathway that they need to develop to get there? I would say, you know, in my mind, and then with regard to character education, the main objective is that students and teachers are, are building relationships with each other, um, positive relationships. So it's, again, just putting students in situations where we are intentionally creating positive relationships among them. Um, and then also, like, we, we know you as a person. This is a place you can come um, when you are feeling down. This is a place you could come when we want to celebrate something. And you matter as an individual, because everybody in this group, like everybody knows who you are and everybody cares about you. This staff member cares about you. You know a little bit about me. I know a little bit about you. Um, and so to me, and this is, you know, my opinion, but the main objective of advisory is to build those relationships so that students know that they matter. Mm -hmm. Well, how long does it take to accomplish that? Well, I think that's year? ongoing, you know, as well, things that's, come that's up. that's right, yeah. So should that be the main function of an advisory? To continue to like foster to those relationships. relationships, but it yeah. seems like a lot of the activities that have other results could be incorporated in that while you're maintaining and developing relationships. Yeah, I mean, I think you could use that time for for everything, for mm -hmm. for anything. Like I said, you could do academics. You could do just this is the mm -hmm. place where we feel comfortable, or um, you know, if you you need something or you want to like express something, this is the place where we could talk about those issues and do that. Um, and so I think that's it's like serves as a as a um, structure mm -hmm. that we have in place that we are intentionally creating these relationships and we have this safe place for kids every day. Mm -hmm. uh, how about guidance activities in the classroom where counselors go in and you know talk about character values or character traits or whatever? Yeah, um, so that's happening a bit. Um, with our curriculum though, uh, our counselors really sixth grade 
Um, and I, w I guess our counseling curriculum, we've taken a little bit more of a, um, a responsive approach for those things. If there's an issue, the counselor gets involved. Um, but our intentional curriculum is actually a little bit more about um, careers, about learning styles, um, about student strengths. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as much of relational issues as I think we would like. Um, but what we found in the past couple years and in our study is that our counselors and our teachers <laughs> are not do not have time to give up their their class for the counselor to come in and hey I'm going to do this you know proactive lesson and so that's why I think advisory is a really nice thing. The other added benefit of that is that when it is the counselor coming in and doing that lesson, well then I think sometimes the teachers look at it like oh that's a counseling thing I don't need to do that. And when really you think about building relationships and teaching kids to be a good people, that's that's everybody, that's all of us. And if we think about why we got into education, that's probably the reason most of us are here. Sure. You know. Do counselors sit in on team time very often, and how about special ed teachers and other specialists? I, with the counselors, I know that um, they sit in on grade level meetings, and they sit in on, on every single IEP, so that connects. Mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to that team time with the uh, special educators, but mm -hmm. um, I think when they can, when they're not otherwise tied up with whatever student whether issues are happening, um, then yes, they do. Yeah. So I, I can speak um, for most of the middle schools each week uh, the assistant principal and counselor go into team time to discuss student needs, mm -hmm. um, SSD teachers join uh, and we get coverage for them. Sometimes those schedules don't overlap when the time the team time is there mm -hmm. when the SSD teacher is free. Uh, but that is a weekly basis here at Central Middle and I know at the Good. other middle schools. Mm -hmm. right. that's, I know okay. time is a factor, and getting people together at one time is not an easy task. Right. But uh, Another example from a previous question, one of the hopes when it comes to advisory for us is to eventually have character council where students will go into each family group and teach mm -hmm. the lesson to other students. Um, and so our counselors here at Central Middle and other places have advisory groups, um, but eventually we want it to be student-led yeah. discussions by the character council. That's great. Thanks. I'm not sure if this is for Aaron, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have the transition of uh, students from uh, fifth grade into middle school, especially those that have IEPs and 504s. And, I'm, and of course, the same thing happens when they leave middle school and go to high school. And I'm just wondering how that works. Uh, so that, uh, I mean, I, I read in there that you want the staff to read uh, where everyone belongs. And I'm just wondering, I'm not sure what that book teaches them or what would be the outcome of that. Is that enough? Seems like, uh, and I'm not sure what you meant by staff, if you meant teachers. Okay. Because it seems like every teacher should be trained in IEPs. Now, every class has got at least one, if not more, of those kinds of students. and. Absolutely. So I'll clarify. Um, with the transition, we, we try our best to get our a counselor from fifth and sixth, thank you, and uh, eighth and ninth at every IEP and 504 meeting because those happen annually. Um, I would say most of the time that happens if they're barring you know, a, a crisis of some sort where the, they, they can't reschedule it. Where everyone belongs is actually, um, if you're familiar with Link Crew at the high school, we have uh, West and South High participate in Link Crew. Um, and it's again a strategic, intentional, this is we're, we're building relationships, we're um, transitioning our eighth graders to become ninth graders, so they go up, they do a visit. Um, they have a Link Crew leader who uh, has about five eighth graders who they shepherd through that first year. They have all kinds of events, transition events throughout the year. Where everyone belongs is actually the, the middle school version of that, is getting kids from fifth to sixth grade. So we have, we have not implemented it yet, but we have, I believe, three of our middle schools that will go to be trained in this year-long transition process for our fifth graders to becoming sixth graders so that um, when they, upon arrival, um, here's our strategic plan for transitioning you, and we're, and we're not just talking about one orientation day, we're talking about events throughout the year. They're gonna help you as a sixth grader in our school uh, be a part of our community. And they'll be paired with a mentor, I assume an eighth grade um, mentor, who applied for that position, that leadership role, and uh, really wants to welcome the sixth graders. 
You know, I, I like the idea that with our principal meetings that it's not just high school, it's all the principals. So you kind of have this feeling of transition. How well do you feel our elementary curriculum aligns to the middle school and middle school then for students going into high school? With our counseling curriculum or? Just in just general. In general? I mean, are, are, the student, are the students? I don't know that that's me. <laughs> Um, All right, pass the baton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we've been really excited the last couple of years to work on that. Uh, from an ELA and perspective, I'll, I'll speak to first a, a K-8 alignment and really helping our uh, middle school teachers be uh, more confident in their reading and writing workshop format. And we've gone to elementary schools a lot to learn from them, to watch from them, as well as got, um, getting firsthand training ourselves. And we've also been working with the high schools on vertical teaming and articulation. Um, I think the opportunity that we might see with the new standards coming in April 2016 is to continue that. Like I said, we are doing work 612, but also that K-8 um, strategic vertical alignment with our partners and our elementary coordinators. And our teachers really love they love going to see other teachers in like buildings across the middle schools, but they are begging for more time to go into elementary and high and watch instruction and get a feel for what their students experience. And I think it's one of the most powerful professional development things that we can do. And we do take all year two teachers on learning walks. And I know that's part of our work that we've talked about it as K-12 curriculum um, coordinators is getting them into the various levels so they can see firsthand the connections and ensure that the rigor is high enough in middle school based on what we're seeing in fifth grade. We're always blown away by what fifth graders can do when we go visit. And I think the true is the same is true when high school teachers come to visit middle school. They say, oh my gosh, I had no idea they were doing that in seventh or eighth grade. So to continue to develop those aha moments is, is really, really important and get people outside of our own context. All right, great, thank you. By the way, how many social workers do we have in middle school? <laughs> this is Aaron's show. Oh, hey, come back. Um, I believe we have five, but it is not done by, it is done by either area, geographic area, or um, we have a couple of social workers that they also have like a specialization. So some of our students in transition, that's their added focus. Um, some are um, ESOL families, um, trying to think of the other specialties. Okay. I think that came came to light when I think Rockwood recently just employed yeah. like five or six more, and then we did they, we did some comparisons, and it's it, yeah, it's very true. Chelsea's correct. Uh, uh, that's one area of staffing where we are not favorable comparatively. So, example, at Central Middle, we get our. Go Talk to Mike. Yeah, talk to Mike. Yeah, because those that are get to the mic, well, Mike. The five, the five. She's in San, in San Diego, uh, and, and the other five. Most middle schools only get their social worker one day a week, unless there's an emergency and they're needed to come over because they're shared. So at Central Middle, we get our social worker on Friday, um, and and if needed throughout an emergency, if it comes up Monday through Thursday. Can I call? Can I call Kevin to the mic? <laughs> Aaron, Aaron would love you to call him. Yeah, yeah I'll, de I'll defer. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever Aaron says. <laughs> My question for Kevin is, is one that I, I, I don't think I'm going to catch him off guard here, but, you know, we, we've changed grading assessment reporting at, uh, at elementary. So isn't just a natural that, you know, that the parents as they now have middle school children are going to say, wait, what's, what's happened here? We've had this new system. So it's all. Yeah, it's certainly a question that we got frequently from as we we went around to every elementary school and talked with PTOs at every elementary school in the district about that transition over the last couple of years and probably one of the most frequent questions we got is what does this mean for middle school and what's going to be happening at middle school and up until now my answer has been we have a middle school study and that's happening now and we'll, we're and really trying to honor the process of there will be recommendations. I, I can't really answer that right now, but I think everybody has seen it does need to be a, a tr smooth transition. We want to, just like we transition our students from fifth to sixth, and then again from sixth 
from eighth to ninth. We want to make sure that that's a smooth transition, and want to make sure that uh, we're we're being even consistent, so our parents aren't you know pulled different directions all the time. So that is a natural uh, evolution of where we're going. So this consistency is also consistent with what's going on in elementary in terms of growth and you know some consistency about what what we were really viewing as as those those key benchmarks and yeah and we're really um, leaning on the same beliefs and principles yeah. that we built off of in elementary to really try to get mm -hmm. clear about what a grade means what is it that when we say a student has learned at an A level mm -hmm. what, what does that mean and when our teachers said consistency is the thing that we want most a lot of them uh, in fact we did that survey and we saw that um, less than half of our teachers felt that they were being consistent with teachers who also taught the same course so yeah we want to get clear on what does it mean to learn an a level a b level a c level and help that be something that can be clear when we say you learn at this level what does that mean and even handling other things uh, for example we know that there's a lot of non-academic things that are really important to life and right now we give a citizenship grade that the surveyor is also pretty clear that this is not the most effective way. Uh, really, it's, it's completely unclear what that means. So we want to even get, if we're going to uh, be clear, we probably need to report both. We need to be able to talk about things that are academic. Did they meet the expectations? Have they really mastered what we expect them to master in this course? But also, are they being responsible? Are they being a good teammate? Are they learning to work well with others? Are they doing those non-academic things that we know are so important to being a successful graduate, a successful employee, a successful person outside of school as well? Thank you. Jasmine, can you talk about how in middle school the ELA grading is taking place right now? And are you envisioning that? Because right now what we see is a beginning uh, developing proficient and but then there's a grade overall assigned and sometimes I'm being told those grades don't really fit we're trying to fit a circle into a square peg or whatever sure. however that is and so is that what's going to happen in all of the other core courses as well or all the other courses as well or some different type of fair question well, our recommendation is actually to bring together a team to specifically answer that okay. so I can't stand here and say here's exactly what we're going to do because it's going to be involving our teachers represented from every school every content area I can tell you currently what's happening with ELA in, L in middle school is we have two schools who had really been moving forward with wanting to communicate more clearly about the different areas in their content rather than summarizing them together and that's Northeast and Southwest and at those two schools um, they've they've been doing that for the past several years where they do say are we are we really advanced in terms of reading information text are we really advanced in our writing versus summarizing maybe reading and writing together that might be very different a student might be a really quality reader but still struggling with their writing so to try to get more clear about that they've stepped out and those two schools have been doing the same system together where they're not summarizing those into a single letter grade the other three middle schools are still using the traditional letter grade but have been working to incorporate those same kinds of ideas how do we communicate that there are different things going on while still trying to combine that into a, a number or a letter at the end I think that's where a lot of the difficulty has come in where we've had groups of teachers and in this case ELA teachers and and Dr. Yeager has been great to um, both work with them and give us the opportunity to work together over summers or on their process where they've been struggling with that how do we combine where we have two different skills where the level of learning for the child might be different in those areas how do we how do we merge them and I think that's where some of that challenge that you're describing has come in is yeah sometimes it's really difficult uh, when you're saying reading nonfiction information text, reading literature, writing, speaking and listening, and language, uh, those would be the five areas we're really looking at. Well, yeah, to merge those together, that, that poses a challenge, especially when you're trying to be clear and give specific feedback. The, the way that you combine those, that might be part of where you get some inconsistency because you have to make some decisions about how am I going to wait and combine these different things to try to communicate what's actually happening. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, just to give you a sense of what's going on in ELA and middle school, that's the work that they've been doing uh, really for the past probably four years or so. Okay. I, uh, go ahead. 
I, I also have a question in, in somewhere in the text I read, and I, I can't put my finger right on it now. It talked about the collaborative learning environments um, and making that available to all students. And so can you, exp can you talk a little bit about that? Is there a change in philosophy? And is a collaborative learning environment where they're bringing in, you know, there's an SSD teacher perhaps that's teaching and helping the kids with IEPs who need that, and now are they going to be taking that into all of the students within the classroom, or how is that going to be? I'm going to defer to whoever that yeah. would relate to best. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> it's on page 68. 68. Is it 68? Sure. Um, so we're talking about the CLTs there, the collaborative learning teams, like the PLC, the school level PLCs. Okay. So and when, we're, when we're saying collaborative learning team, we mean the individual CLTs, like a group of sixth grade social studies teachers are a collaborative learning team. And they um, oftentimes within the context of that team, they're working on building in days to work together to offer remediation and enrichment, kind of at a tier one level. Okay. And sometimes that does involve a special educator if there happens to be one on the team that they're currently co-teaching with. But that wasn't specifically in relation to, to our co-top model with our okay. special educators. Okay, all right, thanks. A lot of acronyms, sorry. <laughs> okay, um, sorry, um, Aaron. <laughs> I, was, I was missing being up here, thank you. Um, so several years ago, several of us went to South County Tech and we learned about the wonderful programs they had for our high school students. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Marty and I were talking about it and we were um, kind of thinking out loud that in order to participate in, in some of those classes as a junior and senior, you have to have all of your, um, your core courses taken care of and your, all your requirements really done so you've got enough elective time when you're a junior and a senior mm -hmm. to pursue a passion. Mm -hmm. So what we were talking about was when eighth graders register for classes in January of their eighth grade year, when they register for high school, I don't understand how much guidance they're given from their middle school, be it a counselor, a teacher, mm -hmm. um, an assistant principal, in my experience as a parent, parents help each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Parents with older children are able to help guide a little bit people with younger children, but that's not a good system. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can always be part of it, but who is talking to these kids and these parents and telling them how to structure their their learning plans. Yeah, um, so the the high school counselors come down to the middle schools for a minimum of two days. Again, that like like a lot of things in Parkway, this is done differently at every school. Uh, the transition's a little different, but but part of the transition is that a minimum of two days you have the middle the high school counselors that come down that present to the middle middle school students about high school and what that looks like. Some of the schools bring you know, seniors down with them so they can you know, talk to the students, here's what this is. Um, but during those meetings, they fill out a, what's called a, a four-year plan. Some of our schools do a five-year plan. So like, what is the end game when you're finished with high school? And then how do we get there? Um, I'll say that I, I do think there's, we can do work on this particular transition. There's so much to tell students and parents, and uh, what we're finding with that is that our high school counselors at that time, like our eighth grade, eighth grade counselor at that time is ju juggling, I have these eighth mm -hmm. graders, I have all these fifth, fifth graders, graders coming right. in. Um, same with the high schools, I have all these seniors who are crazy right then too, um, and they're trying to figure out their next step, and we're trying to help them with that, and then, um, you know, have these incoming eighth graders. So, um, and, then, and then for both transitions, there's just so much to tell students and families. Um, so they do that classroom presentation. I would say that um, they also do an evening for parents. Um, there's the curriculum nights. They generally do a ninth, incoming ninth grade presentation where they invite parents in. Um, like many things, I think um, it's just it's, it's a tough sell to always get parents to come and listen to that. And to be quite honest, it's not the most riveting information at the time <laughs> of like, hey, when, you know, three years from now, you could be in this class and they're looking at you like, I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow. Um, so, so at times that can be a tough, like, hey, this is relevant to you now. 
Um, and if you want to plan for this then, you need to think about it now. Um, and so we're just, I guess, trying to figure out within our own curriculum, in specifically with that presentation, how do we make this relevant to them so, so that they hear what we're saying? Um, and how do we get even parents on board to, to think about that long game of if you want to, if you, you need to start thinking now about what you want to do junior and senior year because when you start taking classes at the high school, like everything matters. Um, and that's just been, that's been, to be quite honest, a tough, a tough thing for us with the amount of time that takes and, and the, um, the presentation itself. And I think with that, as we look at choice programs, I know that Dr. Stanfill is working on how do we help our middle school students be more aware of choice programs. So mm -hmm. be it South Tech, be it Spark, um, be it virtual, you know, and as we grow our choice programs. So is that taking our middle school students on some tours? Is it bringing some of the high school students in? And maybe it's before the end of eighth grade when they're making that plan. Maybe it's in sixth grade and seventh grade so that the students actually see it and get interested. And then I think that brings relevance to that four or five year plan that um, Aaron just spoke to. So I think part of that is the marketing work um, that Jennifer and her team are working on with choice programs. We took all uh, eighth graders to Merrimack Community Correct. College, right? That's right. Correct. Yeah. And so that was another thing that we tried to bring in this year, and we um, intentionally, with the career conference, um, had very frank conversations with both eighth grade and uh, high school counselors of this needs to be a part of your presentation. And we, again, strategically planned that event um, before they chose their classes so that it was a direct lead and they had that event in December. Um, you start to choose your courses in January. What does that mean for what did you learn on that day? And the counselors, um, both middle and high, were bringing that into the conversation. You know, did you learn a class you don't want to take? Did you learn classes that you do want to take? To a best question, is that something that maybe there should be a seventh grade career conference? Eighth grade's kind of at the end. You <laughs> might get a little late. Well, and so I mean, we it, thought it's that it's a great teaching tool. <laughs> we thought that, that that actually made it like just in time learning because what what we're also struggling with with it is like, hey, we're asking you this question in eighth grade and they're looking at you again like, I don't know what I'm gonna be doing senior year. Why are you asking me this? You're a crazy person. But um, <laughs> so I think that eighth grade at least we could say to them, you just did this. Remember, like that just happened. And uh, you know, what did you like? What didn't you like? You got to really think about it. Um, we also intentionally in that event added a, re a reflection component. So when they got back to their school, um, they were asked to write a thank you letter to a presenter, whether that be like, hey, I learned that I do. I am interested in this industry because of you. Or hey, I learned, you know, I learned that I actually don't like it. But thanks for helping me sort of check that off my list. And I think I think that goes back to supportive advisories and the, you know because I think at the moment we're not sure. I mean you can have all these opportunities, but then how do you connect it? And that's where you have to keep talking about it after the fact, remind mm -hmm. people what remind the young people what they experienced. Right. Because uh, we're talking about a white middle school. Sam, you know this. Middle school children have uh, you know not a lot of attention spans, a lot of things going on, and sometimes the maturity ranges from you know like a third grader to an 18 year old, and right in the midst of a seventh grade classroom. So it's it's really a. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Incorporating that. Oh, yeah. So actually, we do kind of connect that to seventh grade. Uh, they take the interest inventory. Okay, so our, the students, I'm not sure how much we've told you about the career conference. Um, but we connect it to Naviance in that in the seventh grade counseling curriculum, the counselor goes in, um, gives them a career inventory. They get results. It's, they answer questions about what they like and don't like, who they are, uh, things that they're good at. And it spits out results of like, here are careers that you might be interested in based on the way that you just answered that. Um, we then take that, uh, the counselor goes over that with the student, and they're doing it like crazy right now of like, hey, it spit out that you have these three things that you were interested in. You know, is that still the case? Um, are these your top three? Because they might have more, they might have less. So they choose their top three uh, toward the end of their seventh grade year. And then we use that to inform the presenters that we're going to get. So we will have a different crop of presenters this coming year based on the results of that survey. Um, and then we hand schedule every single student into their own strategic like interests what what that survey said they're interested in um, those that is what we schedule them for so um, connecting Naviance, connect, connecting their choice and interests 
and then putting them in front of a real world person to see like is that actually what I wanted to do. And they could also carry over into their four year plan. Exactly. You know, That's that, the hope, yeah. That basically, you know, it gives them at least a, a direction that they can review each year and decide, well, you know, my electives were more in the science category, but now it's the humanities or something. Uh-huh. Um, but the fact that they do a four-year plan, I think, is, is really important, particularly as it follows through with the Naviance program right. and the career ed program. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask about uh, leadership and me and um, Basically, uh, Dr. Marty and Chris and I attended the Leadership Day at uh, Bell Reve, mm -hmm. which was absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, students led the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Then we met with students in the classroom, and they all knew the seven habits, and they all knew basically so much about leadership and how their curriculum, their program, and how they basically uh, a map out what they're doing, how they're achieving, et cetera. I mean, it was tremendously organized. Uh, walking around the school, I mean, character ed leadership is everywhere. So what is the carryover to the middle school? Uh, I, I don't think we want to lose any of what we have in the elementary schools, and I think all the schools are in some type of leadership program, whether it's leadership leader in me or mm -hmm. some other type. Uh, right. But what is the carryover in middle school? And maybe that needs to be one of the recommendations to be sure that that's accomplished. Sure. So with spe to specifically talk about Leader and Me, um, we right now none of our middle schools, there is, like I said, a middle school curriculum. None of them are engaging in that. Mm -hmm. um, West Middle has signed on to, to do that next year. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see how that goes. That particular program, it, it comes with a pretty large price tag. Um, and I personally, you know, in, in my study of different curriculums, et cetera, um, I think a strong base of a general character education knowledge, which is, is really, our middle schools actually are doing a really great job of, mm -hmm. you know, making sure, again, intentionally building community, um, having advisory, um, I'm trying to think of all the other wonderful things you guys are doing. Having a really comprehensive transition mm -hmm. program in and out. Um, they have the base, and so I think they are ahead of the game if they do decide that they wanted to bring in a Leader in Me as a formal curriculum. But I don't think it's always completely necessary. I think they're you know, doing a pretty good job of that carryover, and again, intentionally um, creating, creating community with things like advisory, with things like all, all of them. They're the only level of schools that each have a set of core values um, which is and they were the first to jump on board with that and mm -hmm. so I think that's a pretty cool thing um, so I would say they're I think they're continuing it um, may not be through the seven habits but I actually do think that that is something that our middle schools are doing really well well I I think it's important that there's carryover mm -hmm. because I mean it's fascinating what these kids are, are doing and what they're experiencing and they need to see it happening as they continue into sixth grade and on up, and even from eighth to ninth grade. Absolutely. And, uh, and I, I think it's a growth process and becomes more sophisticated in terms of leadership roles and responsibilities and characteristics, but that's my viewpoint. Yeah, no, I agree. Any other questions for <laughs> Do you see me now? I'm not moving. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, a great amount of work, and we know that the, it's really just beginning, that, but it's, it's going to help focus uh, what you do there at the middle school. So thank you again very much. 14.02. Uh, thank you. Patty Bed, uh, Bedborough will be talking to us about finance and resource allocation. <laughs> Good evening, President Jacob, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Marty, Ms. Ms. Peasold. Um, I am not only here by myself to present on Goal 6, I have majority of my directors also here to present. We do have uh, Jason that is at the COSIN conference in Washington, D.C. So he is sorry that he is not part of this team to present, but he did help with the preparation of it. Um, I just want to share a few thoughts um, in general first on goal six. And 
part of my passion. Um, when I started uh, looking into Parkway and studying up um, on Parkway, researching for um, my interviews, um, in the job description it showed that I was in charge of goal six of Project Parkway. So of course, I started to find out what that was. And as I dug deeper into that, I realized that it was all about efficiencies and um, realizing you know, financial efficiencies, et cetera. And that truly is one of my passions. So it is so exciting to have um, a job that actually matches along with my passions. So in the first year, um, as you know, a lot of the things that um, were accomplished um, that I had any doings with also uh, was directly related to the finance department. So of course, Brian Whittle has continued in those efforts, and of course, he led most of those efforts too, but um, we really worked closely together that first year in order to identify some problem areas and attack those. So um, with that, we'll go into you know, what are the measurable objectives of goal six? So we have number one, that all programs, schools, departments will, fisc will, be, will maintain fiscally responsible practices to effect effectively accomplish mission. So pretty complicated wording there. Um, measurable objective two, um, all personnel, time, facility, space will be allocated responsibly and flexibly based on the mission-related needs of students and the financial realities of the district. That one's a little tougher to, to measure and to do, but it really touches everything we do in Parkway. Uh, measurable objective three is more focused in the finance department, and it's looking at our financial practices, having them approved by the auditor, and then ensuring that each year we we apply for and attempt to receive the Certificate of Excellence with financial reporting from the Association of School Business Officials. And objective number four basically covers majority of our capital uh, projects. So all capital improvement projects will be completed successfully and funding will be secured for the future capital projects. So if we go back in history, if we will, just to give a little bit of the accomplishments of the past. So I want to highlight some of those big um, goal six things that have been done and accomplished in the last four years. And then I'll have our directors kind of walk you through some of the accomplishments that have actually been completed this past year. Then we'll go into some of the future objectives that we're working on currently. So, of course, you may remember when we adjusted the school day schedule, so um, getting bus efficiencies, route efficiencies, elimination of some um, of the extra routes. Um, we adjusted start times to be consistent throughout the district, and we actually moved some elementary schools into an early start and not having them all um, begin at that um, later hour. We also instituted full day kindergarten for all students. So not just students that registered or are um, filled out lottery, but for all students. You may recall when we did the north area boundary adjustments, as we saw the enrollment climbing in some areas and some schools having space, we adjusted some of those boundary lines in order to more efficiently um, have students in the buildings. Um, we're looking at that currently, of course, as new uh, subdivisions come online too. Um, so that's not a once and done process. Of course, we lived through the budget reduction process where um, we had to tackle $14 million in, in budget decreases. Food service went through a reorganization where we actually reduced one of the production centers and have just the three production centers that serve majority of the schools and then West um, High actually produces the food for that location only. We had the refunding of the 2009 bond issue that we saved over $3.5 million in interest and we had our partnership that has begun with Kelly Sports Marketing we have several wellness initiatives led by Leah Gonzalez, where that has proven to show that our um, increase in our medical claims have stabilized. Um, and of course, 
evidence with the Ameren check presentation earlier today are numerous energy efficiencies, including the, the solar panels and the um, additional controls on our HVAC um, that have just proven all of our energy efficiencies. Now, the check that we received was not exactly new money to us. It's money that we have received throughout the years, which I believe she said 1.4 million actually went for the solar panels specifically, and just under a half a million dollars of that were from other projects, so including the LED lighting and the interior lighting that we um, are currently undertaking too. Most of that rebate money that we received through um, Ameren for those rebates, we actually turned that over and turned that into additional projects projects that we uh, tackle. Um, but remember when with the Ameren check presentation, she mentioned all of the energy that we've saved. This chart uh, signifies not only um, the electric, but the gas that we have actually saved too. So you can see as we've installed um, the solar panels, et cetera, we actually are utilizing or using less energy. So when we look at measurable objective three, um, of course we have our AAA bond rating that we obtained not only um, in 2012 for the issuance of bonds, but also that was ratified in the fall of 2014 prior to the issuance of our first portion of our issuance for our um, 2014 bond passage. Um, we have received an unqualified opinion by our auditors, which believe it or not, that is the best you can receive, even though it doesn't necessarily sound so exciting. Um, and we have re successfully received our um, CAFR for the last several years. We're still awaiting the award for the 2015. When we look at measurable objective four, as we began Project Parkway, um, years ago, we were still um, completing the 2008 bond issue. So, of course, during this timeline, we have cre we have completed all of the projects from 2008, and we have begun the projects that were approved from Facilities 2020. So, we had the Facilities 2020 process also that we went through, where we identified all the projects um, that were going to be completed. Of course, November 2014, we had the general election and the passage. In the spring of 2015, we actually had our first portion of the issuance of bonds. In that time frame, too, we also um, implemented the Interneer uh, software, which identifies every capital project within the district. So every portion of the roof, every HVAC unit, et cetera, every age of the floor, so that at any point in time, um, facilities department and the planning department can utilize that and tell us the condition and the age of all of our um, HVAC units, roofs, et cetera. So up next, um, Will Rosa, our Director of Transportation, will begin to talk about all the accomplishments that have taken place this current year. Good evening. Um, so we've had a busy year in transportation, and uh, one of the first things we did, here we go. So one of the first things we did this year, uh, on, on, on so many people, is we updated our transportation agreement with the special school district, and that allows some synergies where we can share bus routes together. They can take some of our Parkway kids where they haven't done that in the past other than from outside the Parkway District. And so that resulted in the savings of three routes, special needs routes. So directly they're saving some money, indirectly Parkway's saving some money for our kids on the special need routes. Um, we also have some special need bus routes that are handling some uh, general ed students, Parkway students, and we're trying to co-mingle some of the kids together because it's good for kids and it works out for Parkway and Special School District. And that's worked out pretty well this year. And this is our first year we've done that. Um, so, so far so good. Uh, fuel savings, um, <clears throat> we continue to have fuel savings. The alternative fuel tax was reauthorized by Congress for 2015. It was uh, in 2014 we saved uh, for the partial year on uh, using the compressed natural gas, uh, I think $36,000. And so for 2015, a full year, it's about 45,000 for using compressed natural gas and applying for a tax credit. Uh, 50 cents a DGE, which is a diesel gallon equivalent. So that's a good thing. 
here's a just a here's that fuel pricing slide the diesel versus CNG and it's kind of small but that top line is the diesel pricing back to boy that goes back to 11 12 and it was up at about three dollars I think 316 and it, you can see it, the, the top line keeps going down um, our last diesel fuel price uh, last week was a dollar 21 so we've I mean we haven't seen that well we know gas is low but diesel that's as low as we've seen in 10 years I think and potentially could go back up, who knows. And the next line, that red line, the next one down is the, the cost of our compressed natural gas. And we've got some pretty um, favorable pricing through uh, Eric and uh, some con a consortium. And that's about 75 cents for a diesel gallon equivalent per gallon. And so then if you take that bottom line, um, that would be adjusted for the fuel tax. So 75 and we're getting 50 cents a diesel gallon equivalent. So really we're paying about a quarter for a diesel gallon equivalent of, of fuel, which is unbelievably low. Um, our fleet is 25% CNG. So 25% of our fleet, we're paying really effectively a quarter a, a diesel gallon equivalent. Now they get a little different gas mileage, but um, it's still it's still pretty pretty amazing. Okay, so also this year we did a map upgrade, and we haven't uh, we haven't um, we haven't changed our map in 15 years. So a lot of the streets we had to, we we can draw streets in our map, our current software routing planning, and they're not exactly accurate when we draw them in. And the new 141, we didn't draw that in at all, but we could. And so this new map upgrade has all the, the new streets in there and it's more accurate. It also has some enhancements because we can change the, the speed limit on a segment of a street so we can adjust it so our route timing is more precise. Instead of just saying it's 45 down Ledoux or 30 or whatever the speed is, we can adjust it to 20 different segments and it gets us to our stops on time more efficiently. Um, it also allows, our new software allows a uh, overlay of Google Maps that we couldn't do before, so we can take our routes and we can, we can put them onto a uh, Google Map, and I'll show you what that looks like, gives you a nice visual. And so the, the map on the left is the Barrett, this is just an example of what it looks like. So we took all the map routes, I think there's six at Barrett's Elementary, and we put them, overlaid them onto the Google Earth program, and so you can visually see where all the buses are going, helps us do some routing and, and make sure we're doing the right things. And then if you zoom down to the, the route, the picture on the right, that's just one route that we're, we're looking at. And we can say, wow, look at that. There's, there's 20 stops on it. So we can, it helps us with our analysis. And then you can get all the way down to a street level with this Google Earth. So we can say, is a bus stop safe? You know, what's, what, what does it look like without driving to every bus stop? So it's a, it's a quick tool when we're talking to parents and, and, and looking for, for the safest bus stops possible, as you can see in the final map. And I think I'm going to turn it over to Mike. Oh, sorry, Marlene. Okay, so good evening. How are you tonight? Good. Um, just wanted to talk to you a little bit about our ventless ovens that we're trying to institute in all of our schools. So we have kind of a plan to do five a year, provided that um, we have our gift from you guys every year of $200,000, and we thank you very much for that to help with our capital um, improvements. So thank, those thank ovens. You. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Okay, thanks, Eric. So those ovens do not require vents, which helps us to have like vegetables cooked straight to the line instead of cooking them early in the morning and holding them in an oven and then chipping them out. This way we can slack them out and send them out to that school that has the oven and they'll actually cook them a few minutes before it goes off to the line of serving. Also, um, it does reduce 50% or more in hot shots. And if you ask what a hot shot is, that's when they run out of food and they have to call for extra food. So those schools that have those ventless ovens um, actually will have extra product that they can cook to the line also. So that cuts down on the emissions on our um, trucks and also time. And best of all, it makes the food a little bit fresher too for the kids. Um, Energy Star refrigerators and freezers. Um, yes, I do have to thank Eric for that because he's been on my back all the time to make sure that everything that we bid out has that criteria in there. And even if it costs a little bit more, we know that um, in the long run, it's the best for our environment. Um, online free and reduced applications. Uh, that one probably, that software excites me the most because it's for the students. Instead of taking anywhere from five to 10 days to approve an application because either a parent didn't have the correct information in there, 
um, something was missing, an address, Social Security, sometimes a child that they forgot to add. Um, this way they go online, they cannot move past that screen until all fields are completed. And then once it's completed, it's 24 hours that a turnaround time. So I really think that's helpful for our students because they're not waiting, they're not incurring charges that maybe their parents couldn't afford to pay back. So it also helps us in our department to be more efficient. Um, the new inventory system is great too and I have a new lady who's running it and she has picked up probably in the last month or two, she just makes that inventory system home. Um, we can track the food more accurately and I believe we're a little more accountable for our inventory because it's that easy to use. Um, finally, partnering with transportation and that would be Will Rosa and his staff. Sometimes um, the drivers come in very early and then there is a break between their morning runs and their afternoon runs. So we have been able to utilize some of their employees to fill in at our kitchens, um, either as a sub or that might be their regular place to go in between their runs, provided that we don't go over the 40 hour, you know, we don't want to have overtime. So I just think it's kind of nice to partner together with them. Um, and next is Mike, and he will talk to you about the HVAC system. Good evening. One of the things that we've done over the last nine, nine months is really expanded the use of our HVAC alarms. So we've always had the ability to alarm critical pieces of equipment. Some of it was, some of it wasn't done well, but over the last nine months, we've identified all of our critical chillers, boilers, and critical alarm points. And that alarm then goes to the maintenance supervisor and HVAC leads phones and not, this was not one of our more popular moves initially because at two o'clock in the morning when the chiller alarm goes off, you get woken up. The good thing about that though is that from an efficiency standpoint, we fixed a lot of problems that we didn't know we had and got things running a lot better. And uh, when the boilers switched over to the wintertime, I asked how many alarms we got, a few. When we went going back to HVAC and going back to the cooling systems, not really anything. So uh, it, uh, when, when, when you're accountable for it and you're getting woke up, it's amazing. You really do get the guys on it and they get it fixed correctly. So it was a good thing for us. And then that, that just benefits our schools. Uh, reorganization of our maintenance grounds and custodial. In our maintenance group, um, we reduced one of our supervisors. So we now have instead of three, we have two. Um, it's really worked out well for us. I, I think our day-to-day -day communication has improved immensely. Uh, I'm meeting with all of our groups on a quarterly I met with the carpenters uh, this morning. I met with the uh, HVAs, TC techs yesterday, and I'm meeting with the electricians next week. So I'm also getting a little bit more hands-on with, uh, with the group and with our new supervisors, but it's, it's going very well. Uh, custodial, we realigned that. Uh, Della Turner, who is one of our supervisors, is now our lead. And again, it's helping with our day-to-day -day commun communications, as well as just making sure we have consistency uh, with our custodial supervisors and the message work we have going out with our custodians. And finally, in our grounds area, that's our, that was our largest uh, change. We really sort of changed the whole place up. Um, went from three two-person crews cutting grass to four three-person crews cutting grass, increased our grounds uh, group, real relocated assets. We no longer have a dedicated concrete crew. Uh, our operations team is picking that up in their group, so that was not in increased at all. We took those folks and put them on the grass. Trying to get our, our athletic fields looking better and trying to get our landscaping and our general appearance at our schools looking better. So that is all rolling out this spring. It, uh, we added a new crew chief on, so we now have, I guess, have four crew chiefs for the four crews and uh, we're assigning people to those and that's all moving forward. Uh, we've enhanced our, our preventive maintenance program immensely over the last nine months. Um, give you a little bit of an idea where we were and where we're going, and we'll use Central High as an example for their air conditioning. They have about 25 rooftop units over there. The, the way we used to do PMs is we had one PM for all the rooftops at Central High, and they would go up and write all of what they did on one PM. We've now changed that to each unit gets a PM, and instead of writing additional work orders for work, you do everything on that PM. What's happened is we've increased the number of PMs from about 1,000 
uh, 5,240 over the last nine months. Um, we're really not making any more work for anyone. But when you're trying to, to standardize your PM and then use that standard to compare how you're, you're doing against other organizations, that's the right way to do it. So we've gone from about a 10% PM ratio, PM to regular work hours, to right now we're pushing 40 and we anticipate that to go to 50 by next year. And we're really not making any more work for the individuals. It's just a better way of tracking what we're doing. And then we can compare ourselves better against universities and other K through 12s as to how they're doing their PM work. Uh, what we have seen is we've seen a reduction in our emergency work orders over the last five years from approximately 13% to less than one. We're at 0.89% right now for emergency work orders. And we expect to see that go down lower. So it's a, it's a good story to, on what we're doing on control on our, our maintenance. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. Hello again. Um, so yeah, I want to touch on our managed print services uh, agreement. With this, this is a uh, element that our technology department has rolled out, and it's been a great advantage to the district because this is a program that has allowed for greater transparency into the district print behavior. So that includes all the toner, ink, uh, and paper associated with that, as well as the wear and tear on the equipment that we have, as well as even having more visibility for what devices that we have out there. Um, and, and this program has allowed the technology department to form, focus more on their core competencies uh, while allowing a specific service contractor to uh, manage our, our printer fleet throughout the district. Um, this also was able to utilize Parkway's purchasing power and buying power for toner and printer repair parts and service. So in, in effect, actually driving down the cost and the expense that the district has for the amount of print that we are actually doing throughout the district. Uh, and it does actually also tie in with the concept of preventive maintenance for those, so for these larger printer devices that we are having those serviced and maintained regularly. Uh, the PC Power Management Program is a excellent partnership. We've also worked with technology department um, to centralize a software platform that turns our desktop devices to standby at a certain time of being inactive. So in essence, it's a built-in occupancy sensor uh, for these desktops. So after a certain amount of activity, it goes to sleep, or after a certain time of day, it goes to sleep. Uh, this has been a huge success to roll out. Um, this this slide was, was crafted before, um, just before spring break. This amount has increased, but right now, so far since rollout, We've been we've looked at uh, saving over thirty eight thousand dollars in electricity costs associated with implementation, um, and this is something that that Amron did incentivize for. So the cost of the district to roll us out was virtually negligible. Um, so this is a, a great program, and we anticipate a lot of um, good results moving on. So next we have the LED exterior lighting project. This, by all means, was a large task. So we've got a video here for you uh, that we will be displaying. But before, just want to give a definitely a big um, kudos and shout out for our district electricians that had a massive undertaking for all the light fixtures, all the light fixtures uh, in the district. So in a very short amount of time. Sure. So, um, so working on the audio and technical difficulties, but in essence, this is a was a massive undertaking that the district underwent um, in changing over fourteen hundred, over fourteen hundred different light fixtures across the entire district. Um, 
this this is a YouTube video, so you know when you get home tonight, you know because I'm sure you're going to be wide awake and want to watch something else. We've got a great video here uh, that Will Rosa helped us put together. So uh, he's, he's got a director of capabilities in more than just transportation uh, video as well. Um, so it, it, this is an excellent project. So we're we're saving an immense amount of money. There's a control system that allows us to dim these light fixtures at late at night when there aren't people on the lots. Um, and they, when people are on the lots, we raise that light level rises up because it has an occupancy level into it. But when it's dim, it's actually saving more money. Uh, the district is estimated to save about $130,000 over the course of a year. This is Ren Elementary. This is Southwest Middle. So these are some after photo or after still shots. Um, this is South Middle. And then this is going to be a, well, maybe not, uh, videos. So this is a video, a flyover of, of the drive up to South Middle before on the left and the after on the right. The, the light quality of the new LED lights also it produces a much more uh, even light disbursement as well as not having these spotlights of bright and dark and bright and dark. So it's actually safer for individuals while they're driving because their eyes aren't dilating and constricting as they drive, um, but then also just providing better illumination across the entire parking lot. Um, and with that, we're, we're looking at saving a considerable amount of emissions off the road. I don't have the numbers here, it's in the video, so I apologize. But the, the impact that we're having is in essence taking about four coal, 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 coal cars out of circulation from being burned. That's the equivalent of the carbon emissions that we're saving uh, every year. And then that amounts to about $130,000 in savings every year with this project. So, um, so it is absolutely a, a monumental task and it's been a, um, a great program initiative. So if we can move it to the next slide, that would be terrific. Thank you. Um, so uh, another energy project that we did was over at Southwest Middle, we did what's called a retro commissioning uh, project. So this is in essence optimizing a existing piece of equipment. So we have a existing HVAC equipment. So this isn't time for capital replacement, this isn't time for changing it out yet. So we're looking to actually make the best of what we have. So doing this project, we're actually going in there, doing a detailed analysis over what can we do um, with controls and with maybe slight upgrades to the existing equipment. Uh, this is an example of we, we have adjusted the uh, discharge air temperature. Uh, when it's, it's a little bit warmer outside, we don't, we're gonna discharge cooler air. When it's cooler outside, we're gonna discharge warmer air. It sounds very simplistic, but it's a mechanism that we were able to put in place. And with that, we're looking to save about $15,000 a year with that and the other combined initiatives within that particular project. Um, excuse me. So with that, I will transfer it over. Hello. I was going to have a video too, but we'll refuse to fly the drone in the finance office. I don't know what's going on there. So, so, um, so we have a lot of goal six in finance and HR. The first one is, uh, or the first two are actually developing of staffing and enrollment reports. This was mostly done by Amy and HR and tech services. And what it allowed to do instead of staffing the buildings, you know, based on our estimated projections, they could get day of reports and really strategically place teachers in each of the buildings. Which, you know, it's the efficient way and it's the way of the future and I think it helps save on FTA headcount, you know, over time. Um, in the finance department ourselves, in the past year, we've done a lot of reorganization. The, the thought behind our reorganization was to make us more customer service because at the end of the day, that's what finance is, we're customer service people should just think of us as being there to help. We, uh, some of the changes now, more than one person can answer a question. You used to call finance and they'd say, oh, you gotta wait till Brian's here. That still happens, but not nearly as much. Uh, we also, we took the opportunity when someone retired to reduce the, uh, the head count. Instead of refilling the position, we just reduced head count. In a couple of slides, I'll get to how we were able to do that. Um, Another thing we have done is we've maximized our uh, SSD reimbursement for the Early Childhood Center for the rooms they use at ECC and for the transportation the SSD. 
on average, that's going to save us or bring us in more, about $150,000 a year, you know, going forward annually because we've just raised the amount they're going to reimburse us by taking better advantage of the percentage of the room and, you know, better allocating cost of transportation. And that was something I couldn't have done without Will and uh, Elena at ECC. And there was also a Goal 6 action team created. I, again, I can't take credit for that. That's mostly Desi and Sat. But that team's its uh, principals at each level, administrators. We get together, we review district processes. Uh, some of the things we've looked at so far have been uh, like the textbook tracking system. Uh, at the most recent meeting, we discussed the equal opportunity uh, for schools. I, you know, it's a newer, or a newer team, but I think it's gonna be really great and helpful to the district. Um, okay, one, of, one of the biggest changes finance has made has been in the benefits department. I've really focused on that probably in the past year because I have a strong belief that if we promote education and benefits at A, it lets employees know how great of a benefit package we have, hopefully cuts down on turnover. And two, if you know more about your benefits, it kind of the health insurance items like that cause stress in your life. If we can provide better education, hopefully employees are less stressed. Less stress is, makes them more efficient. Um, <clears throat> as part of the uh, greatly increased outrage in, education we've done, we had a big migration from the most expensive health plan to the lower cost plans, which you don't even think, oh wait, you're just getting people off the premium plan. I, I personally believe when you look at the numbers, if you're on the premium plan, you're wasting money out of your paycheck by paying too much for your premiums. You go to these other plans, it makes you a more educated consumer, and that's why we can offer those at a lower cost to the employees. We, the premium plan used to be well over half of our employees were on it. Now it's less than 50% and every year it's that number's declining and we're going, we're going to these more consumer oriented plans. Uh, last year the health plan added over, had a $1 million surplus. That's not going to happen too much more often in the future. We, we plan a more breaking even a little bit higher because to me we have a $1 million surplus which we de did need because the fund balance was getting low in that plan. It probably means we raised rates too much going forward. You know, it is, there's a lot of things it's hard to predict what your claims will be, but I would hope for just small increases going forward. Uh, we've also simplified signing up for the 403 and 457 plans retirement. We've really increased the education on that. We've had a lot of people say, oh, I didn't even know there was a 403 or 457. It's like, well, now you know, and we made it real easy to sign up. Um, and the next thing is there is a federal student loan forgiveness plan. And I was actually, the PNEA was actually ahead of us on that. They had been educating teachers for about six months before we started. but. Essentially, if you've been a teacher for five years, the government will forgive, you know, your loans, $5,000. In some specialized areas, they'll forgive them up to $17,000. And then any government or nonprofit employee after 10 years, they'll completely forgive your student loans. And that'll start, the forgiveness will be next October, but we're starting the education now. Because could you imagine the relief employees will feel that they no longer have to make these student loan payments? Again, that's one of those things I think it reduces stress. It's one less thing people have to worry about when they go home. So we really plan working with the, uh, closely with the PNEA to just up that education, especially as we get closer to that date when the loans will actually be forgiven. Um, <clears throat> we've also started reaching out to employees, you know, say a teacher goes out, they're pregnant, they're on leave of absence. Well, they miss their, they don't get a full year of service credits from PSRS, the public service retirement system. We've started reaching out to them individually and saying, hey, you know, you've only missed like 5% of a year, it would cost you this much to buy it back. You have two years to buy it back. We can help you. We can deduct just a little amount each, over each paycheck and you'll get that full service credit for the year. And that's good for them because, you know, you, you might now, you're five, you, you've been a teacher for five years, you don't have a full year credit, you don't think too much about it, but I'm sure when you're at 28 years, you're like, ah, I wish I, you know, had bought that way back then at the lower price instead of now at the higher price. And we've also added some uh, voluntary employee deductions. One was for Legal Shield, another was for a gym membership. Those have been pretty well received. They, you know, we probably have about 250 employees sign up between the two of them, and you know, I take that as a positive sign. It's something we're offering that makes the, you know, it makes it easier for the employees, and we get a group discount because we're offering it through Parkway, so they can get the gym membership or the Legal Shield much cheaper than they could on their own. So uh, also in the past year, we've, you know, you've redesigned the fund balance policy and the directives on increasing the fund balance growth by about 0.25% a year. We all, you know, we're on track for that. Uh, we also, on our operations action team, we meet once a month and it's 
pretty much everyone up here, and we've been refining our data points. Patty's been really pressing us to say, hey, what, what can you do better? What can you do to track it? What are the actual numbers behind what you do so we can track it? We have um, also reimbursed our, the, our change the guidelines for employee reimbursement and our travel policy. You know, the guidelines, you know, they were older and then there's been changes with as far as just good internal controls and IRS policies. So by improving them, I think we've put ourselves in line with the best internal controls you can have. It's really a best practice. And we have been updating our monthly financial reports. I'm sure everyone looks through all 60 pages or whatever those, those are every uh, month. But you know, we're, we've, we've been changing it, making small improvements over time. Now, I'm sure if you looked at it now compared to two years ago, it looks like a completely different report. And our hopes is just constant improvement. I mean, I had a conversation with Patty today. She had two more suggestions for changes that I had to write down. So we're always working on that. And we're also. Um, the CAFR, you know, we're always changing the way that looks to meet the newest standards, and we're hoping to get our budget book to meet the, what's considered a best practice and get awards similar for the budget that we get for our year-end financials. Okay, we've, uh, another big change we've had in the past year was we had a lot of paper processes. We actually had triplicate forms for an invoice. You know, we'd sign it, and then I started, I said, okay, that's, a, I have horrible handwriting, and B, I just don't like the idea of having paper in the age of digital. We have an accounting system, why not use it? So we've been able to change that, and we've gotten rid of most of the paper-based invoicing. It was anything like that's a rough transition, but I was at a meeting yesterday morning with, or no, just this morning, with the budget secretaries, and they actually were saying positive things about it. I think six months ago, they weren't too happy about the change, but now that it's been going on, they, they actually like it and we definitely like it in finance, and also going to a more digital base has made the department more efficient, which is why we were able to lower the FTE. We, we did something similar with the purchasing card. It's more digital, we, we download directly from the purchasing card company, it gives us a lot more information that we can put in our accounting system. That way when a reviewer like Patty or someone is looking through, they can see a lot more information and it's right at their fingertips with you know, a few button clips. Um, We've also, in our accounting system, decreased the number of vendors in there by about 25%. We, we had a problem with a lot of duplicate vendors or, you know, say, University of Missouri. We had 10 University of Missouri vendors, and that, that's made us a lot more efficient because we can just we can instantly pull up. We don't have to say, oh, which, which University of Missouri do we pay? We just pay the university, the single vendor that's in there, and we're, you know, clamping down to make sure we never run into that problem again. And uh, as Patty mentioned earlier, we received a clean audit opinion last year. Uh, I see no reason we wouldn't receive it again this year. And we're waiting on the 2015 CAFR award. Last year, I think they notified us in late May, early June. I see no reason why we wouldn't receive it again this year. And I believe it is Mike's turn. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Under Measure All Objective 4, Capital Improvements and Planning, uh, one of the things that we have been working on for the last couple of years and we're going to continue working on is installation of an electrical phase monitoring by school. And you're all probably wondering what does that mean? Uh, what that means is we'll be able to tell if the electric is on or off to the school remotely. And what drove this was several years ago we lost power at Northeast Middle. And we had a a uh, little generator down there that was running our backup lights and we have backup power in all of our systems and we didn't realize we'd lost power till about two o'clock in the morning. Now the power dropped out about seven o'clock in the evening but with all the backup systems until the generator ran out of gas that's when the lights went out and then we realized that then the rover, the security rover, realized that we didn't have power at that building. There was really no other way for them to, to pick, up, pick up on that. So what we're doing is where the electrical service entrance is, we're actually putting in remote sensing that tells us what the three phases, that tells us the phases they're on, okay? And that then gets sent back to security on a standalone screen. And if everything's green, they know we're good. So we've got our high schools and middle schools and several elementaries now on the system. We're doing this as we go through with, with as we get some funds available and then we're, we're doing the maintenance is just sort of handling this as a, as a go-to project, but it may, we made it very easy for our security officers at night to be able to just look at that screen. If there's red on the screen, they realize it's maybe a phase. If we've got a phase, then we want to 
get our equipment shut down so we don't burn it up, or all three red dots tells us that we've lost power at the building. It's a good way, it's an easy way for our security folks to be able to tell we've lost power. Uh, the second uh, measurable objective for our first summer of capital projects from the bond issue were completed uh, successfully, um, came in under budget enough to be able to fund uh, the Henry additions, which we're going to be doing this year. Um, all of our uh, projects have been bid except for the uh, generator administration. That's the only one, and it's a small project. We're not worried about being able to get that one completed this summer. Um, I think that um, as, we, as we go through the summer, we're looking at, I think, $30 million roughly in projects, about $40 million total under contract by the, is including what we have left over from last year. We're still, we got phase two of McKelvey. We've got security projects going on. It's got some things in technology. So we've got $40 million under contract, $30 million this summer. 14 of 30 sites will be in renovation work uh, this year. So almost half the district will have something major done to it this summer. Biggest summer we've, we've ever taken on in the history of Parkway. So it's, uh, it is an exciting time for us as we move forward uh, in the next couple of months. Turn it over to Patty. While we've gone through a whirlwind of accomplishments for this year, we also have a list of future projects that we're currently working on. Um, even today, we were meeting on uh, redeveloping and refining the current purchasing and uh, surplus policy or surplus property policies. Um, some of them are, are very dated. Um, some of the processes can have added efficiency and effectiveness um, and some additional internal controls to help um, along the way. The other thing that, of course, is ongoing is our um, contract with Kelly Sports Marketing. Currently, we have $935,000 um, in revenue so far um, that is under contract for the next four years. Um, currently still working um, with some customers, some corporate partners to come on board. We have three of the scoreboards in the football stadiums completely installed. And the one we are waiting for the permit from uh, City of Manchester. Uh, we hope that that will be installed prior to the football uh, season. We also are beginning the talks of our Facilities 2020 pro 2.0, so getting ready for our next line of bond issues. And it's 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 hard to imagine when we're just halfway through with um, the, the actual uh, construction and everything from the first bond issue, but we're already starting to get in gear and um, get information in order to develop what will be part of uh, those projects in possibly a 2018 bond issuance. We've recently gone, undergone a feasibility study with uh, Xerox to look not only at the facilities, maintenance department, planning department, but also the purchasing department, really doing a, a deep dive into their processes and seeing where some duplications are happening, where um, maybe a lot of manual um, operations are taking place that there's possibilities for maybe digitizing, and then looking at the most efficient way that maybe we can allocate resources for that. So we're still in the study phase. They've completed the study, but they haven't given all the feedback. In the meantime, Mike is also working with the um, American Association of Physical Plant Administrators Performance Indicator Standards. Um, wanted to read that off, not to misquote any of those portions of that title, but what that what those are standards across um, physical plant operations as far as efficiencies about um, PMs, so um, those preventive maintenance points versus emergency breakdowns. Um, you know what's the average service call take? So looking at those standards, and we're going to really do a deep dive into the facilities department and and maybe redesign some things. You know, not, not keep it just the same old, same old, but um, maybe have a facilities department 2.0 also. 
with some enhancements. So um, the other thing that I want to mention is I know in the upcoming months we'll have a program evaluation report for you for the Food and Nutrition Services Department. But in the meantime, they're not stopping either because um, they're looking at lunch tray software, which will have online menu capability. And along with that, we'll have nutritional information for parents and students. Um, and that's really important, especially if you have a child with allergies um, to make sure that you know we don't you know make sure that the food is safe for the child to eat um, up next I have Eric he's going to talk about the better buildings challenge So the Department of Energy has a program called the better buildings challenge which is in essence is uh, uh, an opportunity for institutions and buildings to sign on to, to in essence commit, to uh, make a commitment to a certain amount of energy reduction targets. While Parkway has done a tremendous amount to reduce our energy consumption over the years, um, there's still more to be had. Uh, the way I see it, we're not there until we're net zero. Um, meaning we generate as much electricity on site as we use in-house. So uh, the first step for this, it could potentially, is we're looking at signing on to this pledge and to cut our energy use by 20% uh, over 10 years. Uh, we're able, the image shows that there is a reduction. We are able to use a uh, previous year, so that way it is a uh, potentially a more attainable target over time. Uh, once we start that project, we will set goals. After we make that commitment, we'll look at setting goals, uh, then creating an action plan, and then looking to implement, uh, and then, then reevaluating and continuing that process. This could potentially lead to some really exciting advanced building and operation standards uh, that could lead to some, some really bold action and exciting uh, physical plant and physical spaces within the districts. I get to talk about a fun one, and that's sustainable landscaping. <coughs> so again, you say, well, what's sustainable landscaping? So I went on and found a definition. It's a stable and productive ecosystem that conserves the physical and biological processes occurring on that landscape. Designed and managed landscapes maintain hydrological function, plant and animal diversity, and biomass, soil integrity, and contribute to human wellness. What it means is we're going, we're going natural a little bit more. And, uh, and we've, we've hired a landscape architect that uh, has expertise in this field. We already have designs uh, in place and will be put in on the Henry project, on the North High project. We have a design, we have a master plan put together for administration and we are planning, it's five phases, and we're planning on doing phase one this fall and hopefully phase two uh, this no, phase one this spring and hopefully phase two in the fall and that will actually we we're excited about that because so many people come to administration will be able to use it as a learning tool as to what is a uh, sustainable landscape and hopefully when some of the principals come up and their ptos want to do some work at their schools we're going to learn enough about this to be able to help them start to work in the out in, in, out in the field a little bit. So it's, it's really an exciting time. Our, our grounds folks are excited about it because they're gonna learn a whole new set of skills. And uh, we're excited about it because I think it's gonna make our, our facilities look better and, and put us in a better place. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to, I believe, Marlene. So some of the future projects that we're involved in um, with the facility team is the North High Cafeteria renovation, which we're really excited about. I know several years ago we did South High, and everybody really likes it. They say it kind of looks like a, a college or university scramble system. We feel like this will help the kids to really um, see what is being served. It will help with lessening the congestion. They'll be able to get in, get their food, get out, um, and hopefully increase participation. That's our goal. Um, some of the other things that we're looking at to do too would be sanitation and safety program. And with that, we want to reduce our chemical usage. 
Um, especially, you know, we've already taken bleach out, but we also want to look at some of the other chemicals we're using every day because they can affect the environment when we're flushing them down our systems. It could be the dishwasher, it could just be the three drain sinks, it could be the floor washing too. So we're working on doing um, that. I have a company that I'm working with on that. Uh, freezer cooler replacement at South High. I've been working with Scott Bennett and some of Mike's team. And um, the walls and the floor were literally falling apart. So um, we found that out last spring with the health department and they were gracious to let us do some minor repairs and kind of hold things up and we skated through because we knew we weren't in the position to replace it at that time. Um, the actual material that's coming in is about 174,000 and the scope of the whole project is about 200,000, a little bit more, but we're working with the facility department to do that. Um, leading up to this, we've been trying to be very diligent in our other equipment usage. We have taken parts off of other freezers and coolers, um, particularly melt coolers, and we've tried to rework things so that we could save our capital money that we receive to go towards this project. So we had a heads up on this one and working with Patty, she's really supported me a lot too to keep us in line with that budget. And I'm really excited because I think it will be more efficient. I'm not sure, I've only been here for 16 years, but that cooler and freezer have been there longer than that. And it gets a lot of use. So we've had a lot of repairs on um, the rooftop condensers. So I believe once we put this in, it'll be more efficient too. And I think then, who's next on the next one here? It's Will, yay, Tag, you're it. <laughs> so, so three years ago, it was this board that uh, gave us the green light, no pun intended, to purchase CNG buses, and we, and we secured some funding through East West Gateway Council, one and a half million dollars, and we purchased 30 CNG buses. And so now we've stretched out our purchasing cycle an extra year for uh, 2018 to buy another nine, conventional style CNG buses and, and we applied for some grant funding through DERA, which is Diesel um, Emission Reduction Act. And so we're gonna secure another $281,000 to purchase our next group of buses, which is a lot of money. Um, the difference between this grant and the last grant was we have to destroy the buses, so that's stretching them out. Well, we wouldn't get as much trade, so we're really trying to run them pretty hard the last year. We have to destroy the bus, that's part of the process, but we'll still net somewhere around $21,000 per bus. <laughs> you know, you got to drill a hole in the, in the engine, the engine board. We'll get some scrap value, Eric, for, uh, for the buses. <laughs> yeah. it, it, could be, it could be fun. It could be a fun project. Um, and so that's in 2018, and these new buses will have the engine in the front. They're more aerodynamic. It's a smaller engine. The miles per gallon is closer to a diesel uh, engine. And so we'll see some savings, not only because of the grant and the cost of our CNG fuel, but also because they're more efficient. Um, so they'll, they'll look like our conventional bus is what they're called, the, the type C engine in front. The alternative fuel tax credit, so it was in 14 that we were able to apply for that and get money. 2015, Congress uh, reauthorized it for 15 and 16. So in 2016, we'll, I mean, we're gonna see another approximately $45,000. Of, of savings, which again, I mean, it's, it, it goes to the bottom line. It's about a cost at uh, 25 cents per diesel gallon equivalent for those vehicles to operate. And then finally, there is an RFP I want, uh, that's um, being developed by Education Plus to study homeless transportation in the St. Louis area. And we've had a couple of meetings, and um, I think they've identified somewhere around five million dollars in total is spent by school districts on homeless transportation. So we're looking at ways to um, to center, to have some synergies with other districts and make make it a better experience for kids too, um, uh, a better environment on on buses versus taxis potentially. Uh, improve the ride quality, uh, the service, and then also reduce our costs, contain our costs. <clears throat> and so we think that's going to, uh, that's, that's a study that's being developed now. We're going to look at it, and Parkway's uh, part of that. And then if Jason was here, he would talk about all the uh, upgrades in the data center. So we took stacks and stacks of old server equipment out, and then we've replaced it with newer, shorter, and less servers that actually have more room, more virtual storage room, et cetera, and of course are faster, and use less energy. So what else are we working on? Well. 
in our operations action team, we'll be, utilize, we'll be utilizing the feedback from not only the focus group, but from the Project Parkway Steering Committee too, in order to redevelop or tweak our current measurable objectives. So um, we'll be working on those the next few months and bringing those uh, forward most likely at the um, June retreat for your review and approval. So that is essentially what we have for you this evening. Any questions? So the drone was actually from the LED light company, correct? Correct. Okay. So we do have a drone here in Parkway, but these guys actually, um, both Eric and Will, actually did all that on their own. It's amazing. Good job. Good job. <laughs> something here tonight that not only are you a pretty face, but you have a real great service organization. Aww. <laughs> Thank you. And Marlene said something about if we knew what a hot shot was, I looked right at Will. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a hot shot I'd like to have around. <laughs> yeah, this is an awesome team to work with, I have to say. Great work. A wonderful report. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much to appreciate that great report. You're welcome. Can't believe we're getting ready to work on another bond. Wow. 15.0 work session. There is none. Call for a special meeting. There is none. 17.0. Our next anticipated closed session will be held on Wednesday, April 20th, 2016 at 6 p.m. here at Central Middle School. Details of the closed session will be posted within 24 hours of the anticipated meeting. And before I ask for a motion, I just want to say this lovely lady down at the end of the table here by Dr. Marty, uh, Joyce Peasold has done a great job filling in for Nikki, and we appreciate it. We meant to, I meant to say something at the last board meeting, but th these are the people that keep us in line. So thank you very much, Joyce. Thank you. <laughs> And the most anticipated question of the night, may I have a motion and a second to adjourn the regular meeting? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries 6 So Thank you, everyone. No. No, we're up. Uh, we know.